A war to end all wars. Deaths in the billions. Two dueling ideologies dancing humanity to its ultimate swan song. And could it all start in a bathtub? A grainy photo of an art installation, printed in an otherwise ordinary edition of a local paper. It was seemingly so unremarkable that the fact it was lost to history was almost expected. The paper didn't circulate wider than a small town, the photo wasn't seen by many, and the art installation itself hardly saw any visitors. But to researcher Armitage, it had become an obsession. While his colleagues were busy chasing reports of an anomalous pair of shoes that could cause human combustion, Armitage was perusing through archived newspaper clippings, trying to find the worn black and white photo. Why? It was because he had been there. The installation had taken place in his hometown. He could remember seeing it with his own eyes, and what happened when he sat in the water. His recounting of the incident to his superiors at the Foundation had been met with skepticism and dismissal. Despite walking them through his vivid memory of what happened that day, the senior research team had shrugged it off, telling him that there was no way he remembered it right. Despite it feeling so clear to researcher Armitage that it could have taken place only the day before, he could recall the voices the details of their conversation, and even a few specific key phrases, and the fact that he'd only heard them when he interacted with the art installation. But the senior team dismissed it, saying that he must have just overheard the politically charged conversations of some other people in attendance, despite Armitage's claims that the area around him had been silent when he heard those voices. Hours of pleading gave way to days of waiting for approval for the investigation to launch. When a letter of denial was left in Armitage's pigeonhole, his refusal to accept the senior team's decision led to weeks of angry back-and-forth emails, followed by months of secretively conducting his own covert investigation, trying to grasp at as many straws as he could find, gathering what few scraps of evidence still existed. He was sure the thing he'd seen was an anomaly. He just needed proof. Any moment he wasn't searching, he was recounting the day it had happened in his head. People in his hometown had been murmuring about a strange stage that had been set up seemingly overnight with a bathtub on it. Nobody had been awake to spot who had left it there or why. But overhearing a few local residents gossiping about it, calling the whole thing a weird piece of modern art, was enough to pique the interest of a young Hank S. Armitage, years before he'd eventually joined the ranks of the SCP Foundation. Making his way across town to the park where this unusual bathtub supposedly was, Hank spotted a small crowd that had gathered around it. It was mostly just noisy townsfolk, coming in to see what all the fuss was about, or maybe investigating on the chance of finding something mildly interesting in the otherwise boring place where they all lived. As he drew nearer, craning his neck over some of the crowd taller than him, Hank spotted the stage that he'd heard described. Sure enough, there was the bathtub too, a freestanding ceramic one. In fact, it looked similar to the one his grandmother had owned, a fairly commonplace kind that was sold in the United States between the 30s and 60s. Seeing one only a decade out of that time frame was hardly a rarity. But there was something that had been left out of the description Hank had eavesdropped on. A sign on a simple stand, with a phrase printed on it in plain lettering. The sign read, The Debating Tub. There was no other information, nothing else to placate the crowd, whose curiosity was already starting to dwindle. Some stayed, expectantly watching the stage, waiting to see if something might happen. Others gave up early and started drifting away, figuring they had better things to do. After all, it was a Saturday. MASH would be on soon, unless those leaving were from a Happy Days household. No matter how many filed away, Hank Armitage stayed. He'd convinced himself that the moment he stepped away would wind up being the moment where all would be revealed about this strange art installation. He tried to derive some kind of meaning from it in the meantime. Maybe there would be a cash prize like on Jeopardy if he could figure out what this strange oddity was meant to represent. But before we go any further with Hank's investigation, we have a question for you. 
Is something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? Regardless if you have a clinical mental health issue like depression or anxiety, or if you're just a human who lives in this world who is going through a hard time, therapy can give you tools to approach your life in a very different way. And that's why I'm excited to tell you about today's sponsor, BetterHelp. BetterHelp's mission is to make therapy more affordable and more accessible. And this is an important mission because finding a therapist can be really hard, especially when you're limited to the options in your area. BetterHelp is a platform that makes finding a therapist easier because it's online, it's remote, and by filling out a few questions, BetterHelp can match you to a professional therapist in as little as a few days. It's easy to sign up and get matched with a therapist. There's a link in my description. It's betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Clicking that link helps support this channel, but it also gets you 10% off your first month of BetterHelp, so you can connect with a therapist and see if it helps you. And because finding a therapist is a little like dating, if you don't really fit with that therapist, which is a common thing with therapy, you can easily switch to a new therapist at no additional additional cost without stressing about insurance, who's in your network, or anything like that. So if you're struggling, consider online therapy with BetterHelp. Click the link in the description or visit betterhelp.com forward slash SCP explained. Thank you again, BetterHelp, for supporting this channel. And now back to the strange tub that held Hank's attention so dearly. Was the tub empty or full? Did an empty bathtub represent the emptiness of certain debates? Was it an indictment of a philosophy that the artist had disagreed with? But how could Hank even guess if he didn't know who the artist behind it was? Racking his brain was starting to hurt his head. Surely it meant something. By now, there was hardly anyone else around, and a thought crept into Hank Armitage's head. Curiosity was getting the better of him, so he headed towards the stage and hopped up to investigate further. Water. The tub was full after all. He ran his fingers across the surface, then retracted them when he felt just how icy cold it was. The hurried motion of his hand splashed some of the water out of the bathtub, and instantly, Hank's heart raced. Normally, he wouldn't react to something so mundane, but he caught himself looking around, just in case an enraged artist suddenly emerged from the shadows to yell at him for messing with his masterpiece. Nobody seemed to notice. Even the few passers-by enjoying a drink on their Saturday night didn't pay him much mind. That was when Hank noticed something. He thought his eyes might be playing tricks on him, so he braved another touch of the freezing water, scooping up a handful and letting it drop outside the tub. Then he did it again, and again a third time. He hadn't been seeing things. The water level wasn't going down. Examining the tub closer, Armitage looked for pipes or maybe even some of those PVC tubes some folks had. There was nothing feeding more water into the bathtub. It was a neat trick, Hank thought to himself. However, the artist had pulled it off, a self-refilling bathtub. But it didn't answer any of his burning questions. What did the debating tub mean? Why go to all this trouble to set up an art installation like this, and why do it in a small town of all places? A passing gaggle of drunks yelled something as they staggered home through the park, something about telling Hank he should take a bath. But as their laughter faded into the distance, it gave Hank another idea. The debating tub. Was the goal of the piece to get people to have a debate in the bathtub? Not quite believing that he was really about to do what he was considering, Armitage slipped off his shoes and carefully climbed over the edge of the tub. The water was still freezing, and felt even worse as his clothes were soaked through. Shivering at the cold so much that his teeth were chattering, he sat down in the bathtub. And that was when he heard them. Two voices, both men. They sounded so clear and close that Hank had to look around, wondering if it was another passerby. He searched inside the bathtub itself, looking for anywhere it could be coming from. A speaker in the plug hole? No, nothing there. Yet he could hear two distinct voices, one that was clearly an American, the other speaking in what sounded like a thick Russian accent. They were arguing, barking things back and forth at each other. And while Hank Armitage tried his best to pay attention and pick up on their words, picking up the odd mentions of names he recognized, Brezhnev, Castro, Kennedy, Khrushchev. But he was shaking too much, hearing the sound of his own teeth and shaky, panting breaths drowning out the bickering voices. Trying in vain to keep himself warm in the icy water, before long Armitage could not take it anymore, and hurriedly pulled himself out of the tub. The moment he stepped trembling out of the water, the arguing had stopped. His feet and fingers were numb, 
the rest of his body being chilled by the cold night air. He could get back in again, but that might mean giving himself hypothermia. He would come back tomorrow, he told himself, as he rushed back in the direction of his home, bring a towel and some dry clothes to change into. Then he would be able to fully listen to what the voices in the bathtub had said. He never got his chance. Falling ill with the flu thanks to the cold water, by the time Hank Armitage had recovered, the art installation of the debating tub seemed to have disappeared as mysteriously as it had arrived. All those questions as to who had left it there, or why, or what it all meant, were lost to the young man. These were the same questions that both spurred his interest in the anomalous and continued to plague him for the rest of his adult life. Getting nowhere with his research, an older Armitage tried changing up his approach. He knew there was a thriving, mostly underground trade in anomalous art. He began digging into some of the groups of interest that were usually the culprits of buying, selling, and creating these unconventional pieces. Maybe one of them had heard of the debating tub before, possibly even seen it as an installation somewhere else. He trawled through databanks for hours, perhaps even days, until he found something. A report seized from an anomalous auction that the Foundation's agents had infiltrated with a heavily redacted list of the sold lots. It was listed as an antique bathtub, circa 1930s through 1960s, with a capacity of over 140 liters, never needs refilling. That had to be the same tub, seemingly so unremarkable by anomalous standards that it had been overlooked as just an ordinary antique. Searching further, researcher Armitage was able to find his next crucial piece of information, the name of the buyer. While it wasn't clear exactly how the anomalous bathtub had wound up in the hands of one Jacob Ali Alden and her roommate Finnegan, although Alden was it recorded to have been the one to acquire it at auction, the identity of the seller remained unknown. Ali would later come to regret the purchase of the debating tub, however. Pulling some strings and passing an anonymous tip through the chain of command, Armitage was able to have SCP Foundation agents conduct a covert raid of Alden and Finnegan's home. There, agents unearthed some interesting findings that seemed to at least shed some light on why Allie and Finnegan were originally so interested in the anomalous bathtub. Although the pair resembled ordinary civilians, the duo seemed to be interested in the creation of anomalous artwork and, judging from the evidence present in their home, had already made several attempts to produce their own. They possessed a collection of small moving statues, paintings capable of basic speech, and CDs containing recordings of music that could actively alter people's moods. In addition, the Foundation agents searching the premises discovered indications that both Ali and Finnegan may have been frequent visitors to the Wanderer's Library, an almost endless extra-dimensional library said to contain a catalog of all known information across multiple universes. Only accessible through specific dimensional doorways, time is known to pass differently in the Wanderer's Library. Providing some explanation as to why Alden and Finnegan were absent from their home during the Foundation's raid, and why it was deemed a poor use of Foundation time to wait for the pair of anomalous art enthusiasts to return. But the debating tub was there, and that's all researcher Armitage cared about. The bath was recovered by the Foundation and brought in for examination, with Hank Armitage able to leverage what he referred to as the negligence of the senior research team into once again getting to take a closer look at the newly designated SCP-1974. Upon closer inspection, it was learned that SCP-1974 was capable of refilling itself at a rate equivalent to the rate at which it was being drained, able to maintain a constant volume of 124 liters of water, about 24 liters short of being full. Any other substance added to the water would be filtered out and then extracted through anomalous means. But the most interesting thing to the obsessed researcher Armitage was the two voices constantly arguing within the tub. Both were only perceivable when a person made contact with the water inside SCP-1974. The American voice was referred to as SCP-1974-1, described as sounding male and around 85 years old. The second, SCP-1974, was also believed to be male with a heavy Russian accent and seemingly around the same age. The American voice claimed to be the bathtub itself, while the Russian voice claimed to be the water, and each displayed a clear dislike of the other through their constant debating. 
The subject of their arguments would perpetually revolve around the differences between the ideologies of communism and capitalism, as well as the historical and current day status of the United States, the Soviet Union, and China. Given which side each voice argued in favor of, SCP-1974 quickly earned the nickname of the debating tub and communist water. Despite insisting that he get to once again sit in the tub and communicate directly with the two voices, researcher Armitage was subsequently denied any further access to SCP-1974. This came after it was learned that he had used blackmail in order to orchestrate the Foundation raid that led to SCP-1974's discovery, leading to a reprimand and replacement by a different lead researcher. The newly appointed Dr. Hull was granted permission to conduct an interview with both SCP-1974-1 and SCP-1974-2 in order to determine what their exact origin was. Upon Dr. Hull sitting in the water, the two voices were already mid-argument, with the American voice, SCP-1974-1, stating that, in a hypothetical scenario where the Cuban Missile Crisis was never resolved, Russia would have never won an all-out nuclear war against the United States. The voice even blamed the differences between Russian and American education for the other voice possessing opposing viewpoints. Then, SCP-1974-2 refuted that claim and asserted that the children of the USSR were statistically better at science, meaning, according to the Russian voice, they could have won a war against the egotistical USA. This argument continued in an inane back and forth, with Dr. Hull struggling to get a question into either of the anomalous voices all the while. SCP-1974-2 argued that communism would return to power, while the United States was too busy staring at its muscles in the mirror. SCP-1974-1 denied this, stating that communism would never escape the all-encompassing reach of capitalism. When Dr. Hull was able to cut through the bickering and ask about the origins of SCP-1974, the Russian voice of the water explained that an unnamed American scientist had been able to turn a Soviet prisoner of war into a tub of anomalous water. Then the scientist's next experiment resulted in him turning himself into a bathtub, leaving both of them stuck together as SCP-1974. Then, both voices subsequently began berating Dr. Hull, encouraging him to leave the bathtub. Funniest thing we've ever seen. On the 13th of October 1989, the town of Danner, Wisconsin was shaken by a seismic event unlike anything they'd ever experienced. This might have been written off as an earthquake, were it not for one disturbing factor. The ground-shaking event was accompanied by a huge spike of radioactivity. With the strange phenomenon happening a month before the Berlin Wall was torn down, during a period of the Cold War that historians call the Year of Crisis, it's easy to understand why the people of Danner immediately assumed the worst. But the huge eruption they felt wasn't the result of a nuclear bomb going off. The SCP Foundation was alerted to the event in Danner when they picked up a series of radio transmissions coming from just outside the town. When they arrived, they found something incredible, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Standing at the quake's epicenter was a creature that looked to be from another world. Standing two meters tall and weighing almost 300 kilograms, the being was green and brown in color with a bulky humanoid body. Its head was a different story though, and resembled a gigantic housefly with a proboscis and huge stereoscopic eyes. Surprisingly, the strange creature did not immediately go on a rampage. Instead, the being, designated SCP-2273, appeared to be exhausted, injured, and extremely malnourished. It offered no resistance at all to the Foundation containment team, and it was taken to Site-17 without conflict. While the SCP Foundation is no stranger to visitors from other worlds, there was something especially unusual about this supposed alien invader. The doctors who examined the creature and treated its injuries found an appendage that seemed to function as an organic radio transmitter, and large open wounds on its shoulder blades and forearms where further appendages had been ripped off. Additionally, while its insect-like exoskeleton was mostly a uniform green and brown pattern, the creature's upper arms and torso were dotted with a variety of scars and markings that, on closer inspection, looked like military badges. Was this some kind of wounded intergalactic soldier who had been stranded on Earth? If it was, 
then how were the organic badges on this alien's exoskeleton a near-perfect match to military badges worn by soldiers in the Soviet Union, even if they did reference a unit that didn't officially exist within the Soviet Army? The scientists were sure this alien wasn't an alien at all. Underneath its exoskeleton was a non-anomalous human being. If that was true, then this was even more terrifying than an extraterrestrial visitor. The scientists were sure that the USSR had developed a new kind of organic armor, and this anomaly showing up in Wisconsin was the result of a test on US soil that had gone wrong. If that was the case, then there was no telling how many more of these exoskeletons were out there and would need to be contained. The Foundation had to act quickly and find out more. While SCP-2273 was recovering, they called in Dr. Friedrich, an on-site psychologist who could speak several languages including Russian. Dr. Friedrich would be tasked with interrogating the SCP on his origins and the nature of the suit. The interview was conducted via AM radio from a separate observation chamber, as the biological transmitter seemed to be SCP-2273's only method of communication. The interview began with Dr. Friedrich speaking to SCP-2273 in Russian, only for 2273 to respond that Dr. Friedrich's accent was atrocious and requesting he use German instead. SCP-2273, who, according to the organic military patches on his body, was named Major Alexei Belitrov, initially resisted being interviewed. He believed that he was a prisoner of war, being held by the American military. According to him, he had been in the middle of battle, and that the Americans had killed his men and left him for dead in the wilderness. Nothing that Dr. Friedrich told him, that there was no war or that the Foundation was not affiliated with the US government, could convince him otherwise and he refused to talk further. Before a second interview was conducted, Belitrov was given an old copy of the Level 1 Researcher General Debrief as a way of helping him further understand the nature of the Foundation and his containment. Belitrov was more cooperative after that, though the realization that he would most likely be kept in containment for the rest of his life caused him great distress, and he was unwilling to speak to Dr. Friedrich for another three days. Dr. Friedrich didn't give up though, and when Belitrov finally opened up to the doctor, he began to tell him more and more. Belitrov told the doctor that when he was a child, Russia was hit by an American nuclear warhead and that the Soviet Union immediately retaliated. The resulting nuclear conflict, which Belitrov called the war to end the world, caused massive devastation and left most of the planet dangerously irradiated. That is why he had the exoskeleton. It was to shield him from the radiation and allow him to survive above ground. Unfortunately, Belitrov knew very little about how the suit was made or how it worked, saying that it was built by the engineers and that it grew naturally over a period of several years. But Belitrov hadn't made the decision himself. It was his parents who had volunteered him as a test subject for the exoskeleton suit program when he was still young, hoping it would give him a better chance at survival. The process of bonding the exoskeleton to the human body was extremely painful, but according to Belitrov, its advantages far outweighed the pain. The suit not only helped him survive in a nuclear wasteland, but made him a better soldier. The suit allowed him to lift and carry up to 1,200 kilograms, gave him stereoscopic vision, and the organic radio transmitter allowed him to communicate with other soldiers across long distances, as well as listen in on encrypted enemy transmissions. The wounds on his shoulders and arms, where it looked like appendages had been ripped out, were where his weapons and supply packs had previously been mounted. Belitrov had been stationed with his men in the area he was discovered when they were attacked by American soldiers. The soldiers had ripped off Belitrov's weapons and supply pack and did the same to all his men as well. They were all shocked, with Belitrov being spared for the moment only because the Americans had identified him as the commanding officer. Suddenly, there was a bright flash of light and the American soldiers vanished. Not only that, but the landscape changed. Where there had been a post-nuclear wasteland before, now there were lush green trees. Injured and disoriented, Belitrov began sending distress signals, only to have those signals intercepted by the SCP Foundation. The most interesting part of Belitrov's story, as far as the Foundation was concerned, came during his fourth interview, when Dr. Friedrich asked him about the engineers who had designed the exoskeleton suit. In Belitrov's own words, they weren't truly known to man until the years of the Great War and the Revolution. The French found them, 
in buried cities where the Western allies were digging their trenches. Eventually, they were made to build weapons for the war by both sides. By his description, these engineers didn't sound human, but they were by no means unknown to the SCP Foundation. Belotrov described the engineers as humanoid, nocturnal, covered in fur, and possessing technology and intelligence far beyond that of any human. Those familiar with the Foundation's history might already know the engineers by their Foundation designation of SCP-1000, or their more commonly known name, Bigfoot. A quick rundown. SCP-1000 are a species of intelligent humanoid primates that lived alongside humanity in highly advanced cities until their own technology was turned against them. Not only were their cities wiped off the face of the Earth, but 70% of their population was slaughtered, and the survivors were driven mad to the point that their mental faculties were no higher than those of a chimpanzee or gorilla. The SCP Foundation is tasked with keeping them away from human contact in fear of what the creatures would be able to do to humanity if they ever regained their memories and full mental function, and rumors have been spread about them possessing deadly anomalous properties. But evidently, the destruction of the SCP-1000 species never occurred in Bellatrov's universe, or if it did, it wasn't nearly as complete. In that timeline, humanity regained contact with SCP-1000 after discovering their underground cities sometime during World War I. After this discovery, both Allied and Axis powers began recruiting them to build weapons, and their weapons played a role in both the Russian Revolution and the Second World War. It was because of these technological advantages that the Cold War escalated into what would become the War to End All Wars. Both sides were armed with not only nuclear warheads, but highly advanced, radiation-proof exoskeleton armor that allowed the conflict to continue even after the total destruction of the planet. While the humans fought above ground, life continued as normal for SCP-1000 in their underground cities. As Belotrov noted, they never wore the armor themselves, as they had no need to venture above ground. Only soldiers wear armor, and this is not their war. Belotrov continued to adjust to life in containment and sitting for regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich. He was given the rations provided for humanoid anomalies, but in much larger quantities, as the suit required him to eat around 8,000 calories a day to keep it functioning. Belotrov also began taking advantage of his ability to access the Foundation's library. He would often read or listen to classical music, particularly by the Russian composer Tchaikovsky. He seemed especially fond of reading The Time Machine by H.G. Wells. No surprise, given he was able to directly relate to the experience of living through an apocalypse and being transported to a strange timeline with no way to return home. But with little else to occupy his time, Belotrov began to display symptoms consistent with post-traumatic stress disorder, reporting in his now regular interviews with Dr. Friedrich that he was constantly reliving memories of the battles he'd fought and the lives he had taken in combat. The suit was making the problems worse too, it seemed. It was as if he could never forget, as one of its features was an ability to store and replay memories. This feature was intended as a strategic aid that would allow commanding officers to more effectively gather and process information about their surroundings. But outside of combat, this only served to force Belotrov into reliving his most painful memories again and again. Every night as he tried to sleep, he would see the faces of his men, their weapons torn from their exoskeletons, laying in the dirt after being gunned down by the enemy. Like many veterans, Belotrov was being hit all at once with the harsh realities of war. Now that his brain wasn't solely focused on keeping him alive, it had time to process all the horrors he'd experienced. He told Dr. Friedrich, I trained alongside these men for years before they put us back on the surface. Since we were all young children, we were brothers, and I gave them the order to surrender and got them killed. I should have died with them. While the story of SCP-2273 ends here, the story of Alexei Belotrov SCP-2273-1 continues. In 2018, Belotrov was allowed passage to Volograd, Russia as part of an anomaly reintegration program. While he was unable to secure employment within the Russian government as he had hoped, he eventually was taken in by a monastery, 
and continued to write letters to Dr. Friedrich until Friedrich's eventual death from lymphoma-related complications. There's plenty more on the monastery, the anomaly reintegration program, and what happened to Major Belotrov when he returned to Russia, but that will have to be a story for another day. Cast your mind back to the height of the Cold War. The ever-accelerating nuclear arms race brought us closer than ever before to making the nightmare of nuclear Armageddon a terrifying reality. The two main parties in this conflict are the United States and Soviet Union, each amassing huge amounts of nuclear warheads and jumping on any available advantage they can over their enemies. What you may not know is that in order to detect an impending attack from the United States, the Soviets developed what would become known to the West as the Dead Hand. But this experimental piece of technology also had another name, SCP-1984. It is no secret that the Soviet Union feared the threat of U.S. nuclear strikes and invasion just as much as the U.S. feared an attack from them. So SCP-1984 was created to act as a deterrence mechanism, specifically against secure second strikes. Secure second strikes were both a deterrent and overwhelming concern during the Cold War, referring to a country's ability after suffering an initial nuclear attack to still retaliate firing on their enemy and causing untold damage with their own arsenal of nuclear weapons. The Soviet Union knew that any action they made that could be perceived as an attack on United States soil would be threatened with nuclear retaliation, and that if they fired first, America would return fire and potentially annihilate them with a second strike. SCP-1984 was to be an automated system that would activate in response to the destruction of the Soviet's main command and control structure. Given that the Dead Hand was created during the 80s, you might be forgiven for expecting a nuclear detection system built at this point in history to consist of various sensors connected to a computer network. But you have also probably already realized that, if this was the case, then the Foundation wouldn't be so interested in it. In actuality, SCP-1984 is a fully autonomous entity rather than a network of sensors for detecting incoming nuclear strikes or a computer capable of initiating a second strike. Perhaps what makes the Foundation more interested in the Dead Hand is that it is both self-aware and links simultaneously to every single one of Russia's nuclear launch sites. Not only this, but SCP-1984 also has direct access to every single one of the atomic weapons stockpiled by the Soviet Union during the Cold War and is capable of launching intercontinental ballistic missiles at a moment's notice. In short, SCP-1984 could very easily and horrifyingly quickly trigger an all-out nuclear war, resulting in the extinction of all life on Earth. No wonder the Foundation considers the Dead Hands such a massive threat. SCP-1984 itself actually consists of the preserved remains of a Russian soldier by the name of Sergeant Marat Chernikov, who was killed during the Soviet-Afghan War in 1982. Most of the official documentation of Chernikov's existence has been expunged by the Russian Federation, and he is only referred to in fragmented documents recovered by the Foundation that refer to a Project December. These remains serve as the location of a semi-sentient consciousness that has been classified as SCP-1984-01. When it remains dormant and is not interfered with, SCP-1984-01 has the ability to receive and process any signal broadcast to it, and is able to decipher information combined in any signal it picks up. However, when global military tensions start to climb, especially when those tensions affect the Russian Federation, or what were once the satellite states of the former Soviet Union, the entity begins to manifest itself in the physical world, and usually in various strange and different ways. SCP-1984-01 has been known to appear in the real world in forms such as a humanoid outline or a bright red specter taking the shape of a child with its legs cut off. Regardless of which shape it appears in, it is when the Dead Hand manifests in a more physical form that the wider scope of its abilities become clear. As mentioned previously, it can influence and even launch nuclear weapons, overriding their command systems and bypassing launch sequences. After appearing fully, SCP-1984-01 will travel at speeds of up to 140 kilometers an hour, directly to the nearest military installation capable of launching intercontinental ballistic missiles. Once it reaches its destination, 
SCP-1984-01 will immediately attempt to override the necessary systems to initiate a launch. After firing missiles at their predetermined targets, SCP-1984-01 will hastily travel to another facility housing nuclear ordnance, repeating the process until it has successfully launched all of Russia's atomic weapons. When engaged, the physical manifestation of SCP-1984 is highly aggressive and will lethally defend itself against anyone that it observes trying to interfere with it or stop it from causing a nuclear launch. The entity has displayed the ability to disrupt the nervous system, causing excruciating pain and debilitating damage to human beings. Its only known weakness, if any, is a susceptibility to microwave radiation. Although exposure to this does not seem to cause any lasting damage to SCP-1984, instead only temporarily disorienting its physical form. As for the origins of SCP-1984, the Soviet Union's official liaison with the SCP Foundation offered some clarity on this. Ironically, during early 1984, the liaison, a doctor named Sergei, described information regarding the dead hand as being of grave importance to the continued survival of the human race. Seeing as he was referring to an enemy that could single-handedly launch the Soviet Union's entire nuclear arsenal, he certainly had a point. A top-secret conference was held in Sarajevo between the Foundation's O5 Council and officials from both the USSR and the United States, using the 1984 Winter Olympics as cover, avoiding too many questions about several nations' high-ranking state officials being in the same place at once. The O5 Council was then given full, in-depth information about the dead hand, something they had previously assumed was a more conventional form of nuclear deterrence. SCP-1984 was far more, and worse, far out of the control of the Russian government. It was revealed that the entity had been designated outside the original specifications given to those who developed it. Initially, the Soviets had intended for the dead hand to be solely used as a secure second strike response. If the leaders of the Soviet Union were killed, SCP-1984 would react in kind to Russia's enemies launching back all of the USSR's nuclear missiles in retaliation. This is more likely where the Dead Hand nickname comes from, hearkening to the idea of a dead man's switch. Picture that you had been mortally wounded by your worst enemy, shot in the stomach and laying on the ground, rapidly bleeding out. You know that there is no chance you will survive, but you cannot afford to let your enemy get away. What they don't know is that you rigged the entire building around you both with explosives. With your dying breath, you activate the detonator, assuring your own and your enemies mutual destruction. Kaboom. Then curtains for both of you. The pressing issue, and the reason this secret summit between the USSR, USA, and SCP Foundation was held, was that SCP-1984 was no longer interested in just waiting for Russia to be attacked and only reacting after the fact. Instead, the entity's physical form was trying to preemptively strike at the enemies of the motherland, attempting to activate nuclear launches and send atomic weapons to destroy the United States, France, West Germany, and the People's Republic of China. In other words, the Dead Hand was eager to get a head start at causing total nuclear annihilation, not to mention potentially killing millions and reducing target countries to little more than irradiated craters awash with deadly nuclear fallout. Both the Soviet Union and the United States begged the SCP Foundation to intervene and contain SCP-1984, and under the direction of the O5 Council, they stepped in to take direct control of the situation, establishing new containment procedures in the hopes of keeping SCP-1984 from hitting as many launch buttons as it could find. The embalmed remains that seemed to create the manifestations of the Dead Hand entity were held securely in an armed containment complex near Verkoyansk, part of the Sakha Republic within the Russian Federation. SCP-1984 was placed within a standard humanoid containment cell, which was itself held within a Faraday cage, a type of enclosure constructed with or covered in conductive material designed to block electromagnetic fields. This was done to block any external broadcast signals from reaching SCP-1984, and thus causing it to manifest its other form if it learned of an impending attack on Russia, even a fictional one, perhaps as a part of a television broadcast. As part of the Dead Hand's containment, all signals broadcast near its cage are to be monitored, and only broadcasts featuring doctored information would reach the entity. 
Thankfully to the work of the SCP Foundation's Information Control Team, SCP-1984 is drip-fed a stream of carefully fabricated information. Using on-site equipment and facilities, a team of military historians, economists, actors, and Soviet media specialists, the Information Control Team have created an ongoing narrative wherein the Cold War never ended. Through falsified radio and television broadcasts made to look like era-appropriated news organizations, they managed to keep SCP-1984 convinced that the nuclear stalemate between the Soviet Union and United States is still ongoing. Unfortunately, sometimes information from the real world is able to bleed through. An incident involving SCP-1984 occurred on August 8, 1984, and almost brought forth a full-scale nuclear war. While preparing for a campaign speech, the 40th President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, uttered the following joke. I am pleased to tell you today that I've signed legislation that will outlaw Russia forever. We begin bombing in five minutes. Naturally, thousands of media outlets reported on this, but signals of those broadcasts, including recordings of the President's remark, made their way to SCP-1984. Foundation researchers were both unsure of how these transmissions breached the Faraday cage surrounding the dead hand, and were unable to prevent what happened next. Hearing what it could only assume was a genuine declaration of war, the manifestation of the SCP-1984-01 entity happened immediately after Reagan's words reached its containment cell. This time, the entity appeared as a semi-transparent woman, withered and blue, wearing traditional Pashtun dress. Armed personnel guarding SCP-1984's cage engaged the entity, causing it to retaliate, lashing out and attacking any that stood in its way. One captain and two privates that suffered the brunt of SCP-1984's offensive capabilities began bleeding heavily from their ears, seizing violently. Most gruesomely of all, a liquid leaked from their eyes and nose believed to have been cerebrospinal fluid. While armed personnel attempted to use microwave-emitting weaponry to slow the entity down, the information control team was frantically trying to record a new falsified broadcast in the hopes that SCP-1984 would cease its hostilities and the entity would dissipate before it was able to travel at high speed to any nearby Soviet nuclear facilities and begin bombarding the United States. Their first attempt to record a new broadcast that would result in a cessation of SCP-1984's slaughter of its guards was interrupted when a nearby wall collapsed. Desperate to recontain the creature, the information control team tried to film the broadcast a second time and succeeded, although one of the actors portraying a newsreader suffered a stroke and had to be edited out to convince the dead hand of its supposed authenticity. What followed was a short news clip, clarifying that Russia's Politburo was in on President Reagan's joke, including old footage of the USSR's General Secretary Konstantin Chernenko, confirming that the Soviet Union's nuclear forces were not on high alert. Miraculously, after 15 more minutes of sustained fighting with guards, SCP-1984's physical manifestation began to disappear, gradually dematerializing while it seemed to attack with far less intensity. Eventually, containment was re-established, at the cost of the deaths of 17 members of Foundation staff, both guards and researchers. A further eight, however, suffered traumatic brain injuries that left them all permanently disabled. The one upside is that this incident remains the only time SCP-1984 has ever breached its containment and caused harm to others, and considering that it could very well have launched Russia's nuclear arsenal, the casualties could easily have been much higher. So remember, folks, don't joke about nuclear weapons, especially if you're the president. You never know what anomalies lurking in the bodies of dead Russian soldiers might be listening, and if they are, you'd better hope they have a sense of humor. The helicopter lurched and rumbled as it made its descent through the Verkoyaninsk mountain range. Conditions were harsh, with fierce winds ripping through the valleys. At any point, a blizzard threatened to strike. Just about managing to touch down, Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 was glad to be out of the vehicle, even if it meant stepping into knee-deep snow. There were eight operatives in total, Early reconnaissance suggested that they were the only people present within a 5-kilometer radius, at least. That's certainly what they hoped. L9 operatives 1 through 6 all made their way up through the mountain pass, leaving 7 and 8 guarding the chopper. This was a simple reconnaissance mission. They would need to search the bunker for any signs of life, gather intel, and get out. 
hopefully before the snowstorm hit. All eight of them were kitted out with the Foundation's Keter-grade cutting-edge anti-psionic plating. The operatives had all been chosen carefully, with L9-1, the leader, being an experienced soldier, serving 11 years in the unit. He had capable psionic powers himself, and approached L9-2, who showed some of the same gifts. All of a sudden, as the group rounded the final pass and caught sight of the facility, both 1 and 2 experienced severe migraines. Battered by the Russian wind, they had no choice but to get to the bunker as fast as possible. It looked relatively unassuming, a small concrete slab sitting amongst the mountains. The six of them gathered around on either side of the doors as number three forced his way inside. Following standard breaching maneuvers, the rest of the team followed suit, charging in through the open doorway and immediately tipping forward into an abyss. They all landed hard side by side on the slope, some of them rolling down, clattering against each other and eventually skidding to a stop. Very gingerly, the group started to get back to their feet and catch their breath as the wind had been knocked out out of all of them. They weren't in a research facility at all. The Soviet concrete walls they'd been expecting, the old computers and the lab equipment were all missing. Instead, they were standing in a void, infinite and white, with no seeming end in any direction. Beneath their feet and curling up above them was an enormous double helix, a rainbow of colors weaving in and out of one another. It was like they had found themselves standing on an enormous strand of DNA. Floating all around them were glowing orbs of light. None of them could tell how near or far these orbs were. They could have been close enough to reach out and touch, or they could have been on the other side of the universe. And slowly, one by one, they noticed the doorway that they had come in through. It was perpendicular to the double helix and floating about three meters above their heads. Through it, they could see the snowy Russian mountains, their only chance of escape. Four murmured something about needing to leave. One argued back at him. They had no idea whether that door was real or an illusion. They had no idea if they would even be able to pass through it. Besides, it was three meters above their heads and floating out over the void, it was risky. But four didn't care much about receiving permission. Taking a few steps back further down the double helix to get a good run up, he braced himself and sprinted as fast as he could before jumping and reaching for the open doorway. It was as if gravity was suddenly much stronger. As soon as he stepped off the double helix, Four was wrenched downwards, tumbling and spinning, accelerating faster and faster. He let out a petrified scream that sent the other operatives cowering. There was no bottom, at least not as far as they could see or hear. Four's body just got smaller and smaller and his screams quieter and quieter for several minutes until the agents couldn't hear him anymore. And yet inside the heads of one and two, the psionic members of the group, that screaming sound only seemed to grow louder. December 25th, 1962. A man walked briskly through the West Berlin train station. He'd shaved his head the night before and trimmed his beard down to a thick mustache. Dark sunglasses covered his eyes and a fedora was tipped forward. He hoped that his limp was convincing as he shuffled his way through the crowds. One advantage of wearing dark sunglasses in the middle of winter was that he could constantly scan the faces of those around him, looking for anybody who looked Russian. His train had been delayed. An hour outside of Berlin, the train had ground to a halt. German police officers had walked the length of the carriages, checking everyone's tickets and passports. It felt like an eternity. The man was too old by this point to attempt to run away. Besides, running through rural Germany in the snow didn't sound like the best plan. So he stuck to his cover story and hoped against hope that the fake passport he bought would be convincing enough. Fortunately for him, the officer checked it. He looked to be about 18 years old. The man doubted that the boy would know a Russian passport if it was signed by Nikita Khrushchev himself. But shuffling through the station, his feeling of unease grew. Russian deserters had been poisoned all around him for the prior 15 years. A number of his own colleagues had mysteriously gone missing after feeling disenfranchised by the Soviet agenda. He was such a high-profile target that there was no way the KGB wasn't actively hunting him down at that very moment. 
He clutched the briefcase tightly and made his way out of the station. His plan had been to call a taxi, but now the prospect of being alone in an anonymous vehicle with only one other person terrified him. His best protection would be to stay out in the open as much as possible. He would walk to the British Embassy, or rather, he'd pretend to limp there. Lambda 9 operatives number 7 and 8 stood by the helicopter shivering. Their team had been missing for hours now, and they could see the blizzard slowly covering the mountain range like a blanket. Before long, it would reach them. If their helicopter got buried by anything more than a couple of inches, all hopes of evacuating back to base would be dashed. As soon as their team had gone through the doors into the facility, all radio contact with them had been cut off. The Foundation had suspected that the bunker would be heavily insulated, but if that were the case, surely one of them would have stepped outside to resume radio contact and report what they had found so far. Then, all of a sudden, Seven went limp. He remained standing, but his head and shoulders slumped forward as if he'd fallen asleep. Perhaps he had been standing out here for too long. Eight was about to rouse him when suddenly Seven started talking. Hello? Eight, can you hear me? It's one, are you there? The conversation moved quickly. Somehow, one had been able to reach out to Seven's mind and temporarily take control in order to use him as a mouthpiece to communicate with the Foundation over the radio. This kind of contact would normally have been well beyond what one would have been capable of, but he explained that as soon as they had entered the facility, both he and Two had felt their powers growing immeasurably. The Foundation asked for a situation report, and one updated them about what had happened to Four. Trying to escape through the door, he jumped and fell through the abyss. But what was more sickening was that they had seen Four again. All of a sudden, they had started to hear his screams physically, not psionically, and he had fallen past them just off to their right, almost within touching distance. Having decided that it was too risky to attempt an escape as Four had done, the group of them made the decision to travel further down into the facility, descending along the helix. For the next three hours, Seven is unresponsive. He stands there limp in the snow, hunched forward and not speaking, despite Eight and the Foundation's best attempts to wake him. Command, we found something. The helix branches off a bit. There's a doorway there. I can see inside. It looks like a lab of some kind. We can walk to it. Hopefully it's a way out. Command sent authorization for them to proceed. And so they did. One reported that it appeared that they were back in the real world. The abstract shapes and colors, the infinite void was gone. They were in a Soviet research lab. There was medical equipment everywhere, syringes and jars full of, well, maybe it's best not to know what was in them. As Lambda 9 walked through the facility, checking every corner before rounding out, they felt a profound sense of unease. Surely enough, that feeling was warranted. Rounding the corner, one found some human remains. The man appeared to have been a researcher at one point. His brains were now stretched out and stuck to the walls like silly putty. What the hell happened here? Safely on British soil, the man who had defected from the Soviet Union sat in the interview room, chewing his bottom lip. He had spent so much time focusing on how he would escape with his life that he hadn't spared much thought for what he would say once he was on the other side. They had codenamed him Iceman, but he didn't feel particularly cold at that moment. He felt nervous, but he did his best to hide it. I was a project manager in the psychotronics division of the main intelligence directorate. I oversaw Project Redline, which was commissioned by Joseph Stalin following the Second World War. And before he knew what he was doing, he told his interviewer everything. Over 20 million Soviets had died during the Second World War. Their death toll eclipsed that of any other country, Iceman had witnessed it all. So when Stalin had come to him with the task of creating an ultra-powerful psychic weapon, something that could convert the entire world population to adopt Marxism-Leninism, the man had his reservations. Activating a device like that could trigger a war even deadlier than either of the two already experienced that century. He was part of GRU Division P, the Russian arm of highly classified experimental research. Conferring with his team, they devised a plan. They would argue they needed absolute secrecy to carry out their work, even away from the watching eyes of the KGB. Rather than create a weapon, they would create a tool for peace. Instead of promoting the values of communism, they would create a psychic tool to dampen humanity's inclination towards violence and aggression. Their method would be brutal, but a necessary evil. 
In short, their theory was the psychic mind is often limited by the human body. A young child could have incredible psychic potential, but their physical limitations would hold them back from exercising it. Therefore, they needed to separate mind from body, and they had just the trick for that. Traumatic disassociation. They would take a young, gifted psychic and tear out their mind in order to transfer that mind into the body of a controllable avatar. Iceman explained that none of them could have expected how much fate would look favorably on them. Just two years prior, the KGB had captured and brought in a set of triplets for them. The triplets were incredibly rare, conjoined at both the head and the torso, with three arms and six legs. It was a miracle they were still alive. So Iceman and his team set to work immediately. They dosed the triplets up with as many mind-altering chemicals as they could physically endure before electrocuting them for prolonged periods whilst reading anti-violent manifestos to them. It worked. The triplets' minds disassociated, and the Soviets were able to capture it. Iceman was not forthcoming about what they did with the mind or where they transferred it. All he explained was that it worked. They took the weapon to the Norlag Gulag, 50,000 of the most vicious criminals known to man. Luthers, murderers, psychopaths dropped their makeshift knives and refused to move an inch. Even as we threw the gates of the camp wide open, we did that. The final test was on Nikita Khrushchev and John F. Kennedy. From thousands of kilometers away, they activated Project Redline and influenced the two world leaders at the height of the Cuban Missile Crisis. War was averted, but Khrushchev was furious. He removed the entire team, killing a number of them, and began to weaponize Project Redline. If they could fire it at an advancing army, they'd never lose a single soldier ever again. To do this, it needed to be stronger. They were to implant the consciousness into another subject, torture them further, and disassociate again, amplifying the psychic abilities. Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 were stuck in the facility. The blizzard had been so strong that 7 and 8 had to return to base the previous night and come back. Having spent a night lost and wandering through the helix, descending deeper and deeper, the team had noticed that the world around them was getting darker. Periodically, they could hear force screaming and falling past them once again before dropping out of sight again beneath them. They had tried to catch him, to pull him back, but he was always just out of reach desperate to be saved. Seven and Eight returned and their psychic puppet radio contact was resumed with command. The team found another door. Searching through it, they were horrified to find their own corpses floating in the air in front of them, dressed up in lab coats. Just like the scientists from the levels above them, their brains were stretching out and lying together in some kind of web. Yet further down the helix, they found another door. One and three decided to go inside, leaving the rest of the team standing on the helix, ready to catch four if he fell past again. This time, two was in contact with command through his psychic link to the men by the chopper. He soon reported hearing four screams getting closer and closer. The group stood around, ready to catch him. There he is. I can see him. He's definitely falling towards us. Yeah, I see it too. Command, there's something up with four. It looks like he's spread-eagled. His arms are stretched out. He's, he's screaming. It's not getting louder. It's getting... Flatter. There would be no further contact with 2, 5, and 6. By the time 1 and 3 returned from scouting out the room, they were alone. One couldn't even sense the presence of any of their squad mates anymore. They had no option but to continue to descend the helix into the darkness. The smell of burning flesh filled their noses. The echoes of death were all around them. Voices cried out in pain and fear. And then, new voices, speaking in Russian, cut over the top. Stop it. Give in. Don't resist. Resisting is bad. You'll be punished if you resist. Begin electrical discharge. 500 volts. 3 amps. Increase voltage every minute. The operatives had no choice but to listen to the memory of the triplets being tortured. Not just the sounds, but the emotions that flood them. Those weren't someone else's memories anymore. They were becoming their own. And just as they saw into the mind of the triplets, the triplets saw them in return. Command, it's trying to open me up like it did everyone else, but I can see into it. It's learning from us. It knows of all about me. The squad, the foundation, they're almost on me. It's, it's the conjunction, the scientists, the monsters that made this thing, the ones it knew before it died, was that they wanted it to conjunct. It wants to make us part of it. Don't come back here. It wants to make the whole world part of it. And at that moment, 
the entirety of Mobile Task Force Lambda 9 dropped dead. In that same moment, a multicolored sphere of energy five kilometers wide appeared over the facility, dwarfing the mountains around it, designated SCP 2664 A. For years, the Foundation dropped psionically dampening materials and psionically stumped D class personnel into the sphere in hopes of slowing its growth. No other containment measures could be acted upon. That was until 1300 hours on the 25th of December 2000, Christmas Day. SCP 2664 A suddenly fluctuated, releasing an enormous amount of psionic energy that resulted in the brain death of all humans within a 200 kilometer radius. The following day, at 1700 hours, a global occult coalition satellite launched a spherical payload right into the heart of SCP 2664 A. For 13 minutes, tremendous amounts of radiation were detected emanating from inside the sphere, before just as suddenly as it had appeared, SCP 2664 A disappeared entirely, leaving just the payload in its place. Before the Foundation was able to recover the payload, it launched into the atmosphere and was lost. Subsequent reconnaissance operations to the site have confirmed no abnormal radioactive or psionic readings. To all intents and purposes, SCP-2664 appears to be gone. As such, the file has been marked as neutralized. Long may it stay that way. It has long been the mission of the SCP Foundation to secure and contain any anomalies they encounter, all to protect the safety of the human race. Sometimes containing an SCP is a trivial task, as simple as guarding a room or keeping an eye on an artifact with strange but mostly harmless properties. Other times though, anomalies require a considerable number of the Foundation's personnel and resources to keep them under control. This latter category commonly includes some of the most dangerous creatures and entities that the SCP Foundation keeps under lock and key. However, while it might be only in very rare cases, Every so often an SCP comes along with its very own built-in method of containment. This can often be the result of someone encountering an anomaly and discovering the perfect way of imprisoning it before the SCP Foundation comes along and steals all the credit. Undoubtedly, this makes the job of securing an anomaly all the easier for the Foundation's staff. After all, someone else has already done the hard part of the job for them. Or rather, it would make things easier if only the Foundation's own researchers chose not to interfere and could leave a deadly threat kept safely in its box without trying to find out what makes it tick. SCP-5001 is, in some ways, a reminder that some things are best left alone, but it is also a grave warning not to tamper with that which you do not understand. Both of these lessons would soon be imparted on the SCP Foundation. Buried 60 kilometers below the ground in northern Russia is SCP-5001, a 53-kilometer wide structure. It is an enormous biomechanical machine, but to the untrained eye there is nothing anomalous about the object. And according to the Foundation's findings, this is indeed the case. There is nothing inherently anomalous about the structure itself. But there are a number of characteristics that seem to suggest it is, in some way, connected to anomalous phenomena. For one, there's the sheer scale of the structure, and then there's the records that were uncovered about SCP-5001, which appear to have been monitoring and tracking its status. Perhaps whoever constructed it or discovered it kept a record as they observed the structure. Nothing too out of the ordinary about that. But what's strange is that these date back to 11,000 BC and yet were somehow made with modern systems of measurement. And other weirder documents have been recovered from inside of SCP-5001. Records written in languages from all over the world, and even some in languages lost to time. Among them are papers in Phoenician, Ancient Hebrew, both Ancient and Modern Greek, Latin, Anglo-Saxon, along with Modern Russian, English, and Mandarin. Some of these documents are even written in languages that the SCP Foundation's top researchers are yet to properly identify. The explanation for all this would seem obvious, wouldn't it? Writing in both ancient and contemporary languages, records that date all the way back to the last of the prehistoric era, it all seems to point in a certain direction. Somehow, SCP-5001 has a link to time travel. Perhaps it was even a hub for a group of time travelers, right? Wrong. The Foundation already thought that this might be the case, and checked for any signs of temporal anomalies. And yet, they found nothing. 
No evidence to suggest that there had ever been any time travel near or using SCP-5001. There were no devices on site that could affect time, and no traces of any residue or fallout from a temporal occurrence. So what exactly does this thing even do? Well, we're afraid to say the Foundation researchers have been stumped on the answer to that question too, and they are not the only ones either. Way back in the 50s, the GRU's Division P also had an interest in SCP-5001. For anyone who isn't already acquainted with them, they are one of the SCP Foundation's numerous groups of interest, a list of organizations, corporations, and agencies from around the world who have also had dealings with anomalies. In the case of GRUP, they were originally a division of the Russian army during the Cold War. The specialty of GRU Division P was the acquisition of anomalous objects and entities. In other words, they were the Soviet Union's very own SCP Foundation. In 1953, GRU Division P was alerted to abnormal seismic activity in a narrow region of northern Russia. A team was immediately sent in to investigate, and began attempting to take seismic measurements of the area in question. During their various experiments and tests, GRU Division P realized a discrepancy in their readings. Again and again, they checked and double-checked their results only to discover that this reading wasn't the result of faulty equipment or even human error. There was something big nearby. What they hadn't yet realized was around 30 kilometers away, deep underground, was SCP-5001. Immediately, GRU Division P began drilling towards the location of SCP-5001, but for years found that they were unable to breach the exterior of the structure. Defeated, the project was abandoned in 1955, However, Soviet leader First Secretary Khrushchev seemed to have a vested interest in gaining access to SCP-5001. As a result, he privately funded the GRU Division P operation, allowing them to continue their work in secret for a number of years, from 1959 until Khrushchev was disposed in 1964. Of course, this was all during the height of the Cold War. But by the late 1960s, international relations between the Soviet Union and the United States of America were starting to ease. Thanks to the relaxing tensions, a contract was introduced allowing the two nations' secret organizations to work together on a number of operations involving potentially dangerous anomalies. This meant that the SCP Foundation was finally able to step in and contribute to the GRU Division P's project concerning SCP-5001. Their first task? actually getting inside the subterranean structure. Naturally, given how well-versed the Foundation is in dealing with anomalies, they had ideas for how to crack this nut. By acquiring anomalous technology from the Global Occult Coalition, another group of interest, as well as experimental designs created by one Dr. Elijah Rachma, the SCP Foundation were finally able to breach the structure in 1971. From then until the dissolution of the Soviet Union in 1991, the SCP Foundation and GRU Division P worked together to conduct a number of studies into the origin and purpose of SCP-5001. Both organizations were curious as to the technology the structure possessed, and attempts were even made to recreate some of the devices found within. Among this advanced technology were ontological stabilizers, also known as Scranton Reality Anchors, which are located around SCP-5001's inner chamber. These were designed to directly alter the amount of humes in a given area. What's a hume? Well, to keep it simple, a hume is a measure of the reality around us. If it helps, imagine reality as a pile of sand. Now imagine that you remove a single grain of sand from the pile. Congratulations, you just removed one hume from this reality. Taking one away doesn't really do much, but start grabbing handfuls and the pile gets smaller, scattered, less a pile and more a light dusting of sand. Reality works the same way. Take too much away, and it starts to lose whatever it was before. Being able to alter the amount of humes in an area meant that these ontological stabilizers could alter the strength of reality itself, even nullify the reality-bending properties of some anomalies. In theory, an SCP with the power to influence reality could be contained using this technology. The effects of their abilities reduced significantly, although not negated entirely. Another noteworthy piece of technology uncovered was codenamed Omega. Omega was discovered in an unmarked room on a computer terminal that was connected to every area of SCP-5001 by dozens of cables. The software itself was an artificial intelligence construct, 
a computerized consciousness that seemed to serve the purpose of controlling the various systems within SCP-5001. The Omega seemed to work by providing an answer whenever someone used a keyboard to input a question. The artificial intelligence of Omega appeared able to hold a conversation, but would refuse to give any insight into when the SCP-5001 structure was built or what its purpose was. Despite neither group knowing what SCP-5001's function was, an agreement between the SCP Foundation and GRU Division P was formed. Both organizations shared the belief that Omega, the ontological stabilizers, as well as the other anomalous technologies could never under any circumstances be allowed to fall into the wrong hands. They had a pact to keep the knowledge of SCP-5001 and these devices strictly between themselves. However, this agreement was, sadly, not to last. In the early 90s, GRU Division P liquidated its assets and disbanded. A number of the Russian division's highest-ranking officers stole the anomalous technology that the organization had in its possession, which they then sold to Marshall Carter and Dark Limited. MC and DLTD are yet another of the SCP Foundation's groups of interest. According to Foundation Intelligence, Marshall Carter and Dark Limited is a London-based club that has caused numerous problems for the Foundation over the years. They have ties to wealthy figures across the globe and cater to the super-rich clientele by providing them with the most exclusive, expensive, and rare experiences available. How do they do this? By gathering the anomalous items and auctioning them off to the highest bidders. A number of GRU Division P operatives also joined up with the Chaos Insurgency. This is a group of interest that consists of personnel who previously worked for the Foundation, but have since broken away to pursue their own rogue agenda. Much like a number of other groups of interest, the insurgency uses anomalies and SCPs for their own benefit, as well as dabbling in a bit of arms dealing and the selling of highly classified intelligence. Hey, it's good to have a diverse portfolio. Despite former members of GRU Division P seeking alternative employment with some less than reputable groups, the SCP Foundation still managed to keep the existence and location of SCP-5001 a closely guarded secret. However, even with the structure fully under their control, their leading researchers were still baffled as to what exactly the purpose of the underground structure was, or rather, that was the case. On December 30th, 2019, an explosion erupted in the northeast sector of SCP-5001. The cause of the explosion was unknown, but the damage caused a tremendous and almost catastrophic loss of power. Whether the explosion had been triggered by one of the many groups of interest, like the former GRU Division P or just a machinery malfunction, it almost caused the total destruction of SCP-5001. What would be so bad about that? Well, remember earlier when we said that every so often an SCP comes along with its very own built-in method of containment? You see, it wasn't the structure or technology of SCP-5001 that the Foundation should have been worried about. It was the thing inside of SCP-5001. Just as some Foundation researchers had long theorized, SCP-5001 was a cage, a containment unit for its own anomalous objects within, something powerful enough to alter reality right down to the humes, hence the need for ontological stabilizers to dampen its power and Omega to keep the place running. This entity, known either as SCP-5001-A or the Devourer, was being held inside SCP-5001, and when the structure was damaged, it was almost freed. While there was no data on SCP-5001's computer system about this being's appearance or the extent of its anomalous powers, whoever created SCP-5001 went to considerable effort to keep the Devourer contained, viewing it as a threat to all of reality. And all that effort was almost undone when the structure was damaged by the explosion. Fortunately, the SCP Foundation was able to re-establish containment of SCP-5001-A, though at the cost of a tremendous amount of lives. When personnel were finally permitted to re-enter SCP-5001, a number of the structure's core systems had been damaged, but it was still able to perform its primary function and keep the devourer safely contained within. As personnel entered the structure, a message appeared through the Omega computer system that read, Hello, my children. Although you have grown immensely since your earliest days, you have much room to grow. Your species' intellect is merely a bud with so much potential. Your weapons are powerful. Your medicine is supreme. 
Your engineering is beautiful. With proper guidance and care, you are sure to reach an elevated state of being and transcend your bodies for something more whole and perfect. That is why it pains me so dearly to request that you leave this place immediately. Your studying and probing have almost resulted in the end of all I have worked towards to keep you alive. If you comply, I guarantee that the devourer will never escape, and your species will be free to pursue the enlightenment of technology for all eternity. Let this be my final gift to you, directly from the center of my broken heart. Okay, back up. Broken heart? Interesting. Where have we heard something like that before? We'd hate to jump to any conclusions, but when one hears about a being of great power related to large and mysterious machines, and that word again, broken. All the groups of interest that seem to be tied into SCP-5001 and we neglected to mention perhaps the most important of all, the Church of the Broken God. This religious organization that reveres industry and technology over the impurity of flesh has been united in a singular purpose, rebuilding their deity, the Broken God Mekane, whose body was split apart in an attempt to preserve the future of mankind. Perhaps the heart of this great and ancient machine, this devourer, is actually the heart of something else entirely. Though of course, there is only so much we can speculate. Knowledge after all can sometimes be like a flame. It can light your way, but if you get too close, you will inevitably be burned. If ever you're in doubt, ask the people devoured and assimilated by the heart of Mekane the last time it was freed by the church. If ever the heart gets out again, you'll certainly be with them. The SCP Foundation has come so far. Their technology, their knowledge, their vast resources, all allow them to contain some of the most powerful forces mankind has ever seen, and even some we haven't. But as SCP-5001 shows, there is still much that even the brightest researchers at the Foundation don't yet understand, and their drive to poke and prod at the unknown nearly led to the end of reality as we know it. Perhaps one day we'll be able to fully understand just what the Devourer is, and the ways that SCP-5001 worked to protect us from it, but we're not there yet, and there's no guarantee that we ever will be. While the pursuit of knowledge is always an admirable one, when it comes to SCP-5001, maybe the Foundation should have left well enough alone. SCP-3930 does not exist. Thanks for watching. Now check out SCP. The following information is only known to seven living people. Even those actively guarding this anomaly will never know this information. Every single person who believes they are aware of the existence of SCP-3930 has the potential to increase its danger. SCP-3930 has been given the risk class critical, the highest possible risk class for an anomaly meaning that individuals nearby will invariably be exposed to acute, life-threatening harm, and that these effects cannot be mitigated. You learn about SCP-3930 at your own risk, with the knowledge that this awareness puts your life at hazard. Someday soon, you may be forced to make the ultimate sacrifice for the good of all life and matter in the universe. That is why it is imperative that you know one essential thing. SCP-3930 does not exist. Now with that out of the way, we have only one question for you. Can you hear the screaming? It was when Dr. Vasilev heard the screaming that he and his ragtag team of scientists knew it was already over. The year was 1971, and Dr. Vasilev's team was stationed at a highly secretive Soviet research outpost near what would later be established as the Russian town of Yusinsk within the Komi Republic. As far as Dr. Vasiliev was concerned, they were dead men already. Well, that's not entirely accurate. To be dead is to be… something. And the men that had once been stationed with them but were here no longer could not be considered something at all. Their brush with the immensely powerful and classified anomaly later known as SCP-3930 had robbed them of their very existence. Now, Dr. Vasilev knew that he and the few remaining men stationed at the base with him would be next. The Soviet government had dispatched a detachment consisting of around a hundred soldiers and scientists to investigate the anomaly in the Komi Republic. As far as they could tell, 
It appeared to occupy a one kilometer square area within a forest, but to say that it really occupied anything would be a stretch. And out of the over 100 men who had been dispatched, now scarcely 30 remain. Observation teams had been sent into the anomalous zone to collect data on what exactly they were dealing with, but each time, it seemed as though the researchers were doomed to know less and less about what they were investigating. From a distance, the area didn't even appear to be anomalous. It looked simply like a continuation of the forest, complete with the expected flora, fauna, and even some distant evidence of human habitation, like an abandoned building. But without fail, nobody who had ever seen the building up close had ever returned. Thanks to SCP-3930, they had simply ceased to be. Because simply put, when you introduce something into nothing, the nothing wins. Dr. Vasiliev had seen too many good men disappear into oblivion, and soon it would be his turn, too. But first, something horrible would crawl out of the zone. Something that shouldn't exist. Something that didn't exist. Something that will never exist. And yet, here it was. In science, the observer effect is a dreaded phenomenon. All experiments involve the observation of phenomena to collect data and then prove or disprove a hypothesis. But the observer effect describes the frustrating scenario where the mere act of observing a phenomenon alters it, reducing the usefulness of the data. A common example of this in mundane life is checking the pressure of your car or bike's tires. To do this, you need to let out some air, thus changing the pressure. But pressure holds a very different meaning when you're working with what might be the universe's largest patch of nothing. Because of their prime directive, namely researching the anomaly, Dr. Vasiliev and his fellow scientists were effectively forced to observe SCP-3930, and 3930 apparently doesn't like that. The scientists only noticed sounds at first barely perceptible little screeches that could easily be written off as your mind playing a trick on you. And, in a sense, it is. But around SCP-3930, the tricks played by the mind become a lot more practical than anywhere else. What started as sounds soon came to take on a visual form, as more people became aware of the anomaly and made futile attempts to observe it from the outside. These scattered visual and audio forms soon became nicknamed Screamers for their horrific, hateful wailing. Dr. Vasiliev and his team believed that despite the extremely hostile nature of the anomalies, they had no way of ever leaving the anomalous zone. That belief was soon proved wrong, and not long after, only ten researchers remained. It seemed that the last of Dr. Vasiliev's hope died with the lost men, but there was some good news at least. With only ten left to observe the SCP-3930 anomaly, the screamers began to disappear and the anomalous zone became stable once more. Ten, it seemed, was the upper limit of observers that could distantly engage with SCP-3930 before all hell broke loose. And then the SCP Foundation arrived. By the time they reached the long-since defunct research outpost, Dr. Vasiliev was the only one left. The final members of his team had sacrificed themselves by walking into the void and joining non-existence. Vasiliev himself remained for only one purpose to tell the Foundation what he knew, what they needed to know, before bowing out into SCP-3930 himself, along with however many of the Foundation personnel needed to go to keep the number of active observers at a nice, clean 10. That is the burden of knowing. And accepting that burden is to accept that you may one day need to become unknown in order to protect your fellow human beings from the horrors that lay within. But what is SCP-3930, and what are these so-called screamers that lurk within? We have the answers to these questions. The only question for you is whether you're ready to take on the grave responsibility of knowing too. SCP-3930 does not exist. That isn't just a cover-up by the O5 Council. It doesn't not exist in the official capacity. It is, quite literally, the world's largest patch of nothingness and anything that enters it is doomed to become nothing as well. It is a difficult concept to grasp because fundamentally, all language was built as a tool to communicate concepts that, on some level, exist, and SCP-3930 does not qualify. Close your eyes for a moment. 
Seriously, do it. And try to imagine nothing. What do you see? An infinite space of pure darkness? A white void stretching on into infinity. We're sorry to inform you that neither of these counts as being truly nothing. Though darkness may be the absence of light, to see that blackness is to still see something. The darkness even implies the existence of light. The same can be said for the white void. For such a thing to exist, we need both the concepts of the color white and the idea of a void. These are perhaps the lowest bars for existence imaginable, but SCP-3930 doesn't meet them. It is well and truly nothing, nothing at all. And because it is nothing, its containment procedures are largely just a matter of information control. If nobody knows about it, the threat is contained. If ever someone just happened to wander in, they would stop existing, so the problem would take care of itself, as callous as that sounds. On its own, the anomaly would technically be harmless, but when mixed with humans, things become a whole lot more complicated. You see, unless you have the misfortune to run into SCP-3930, you will spend your life without ever having to encounter true nothingness. Even when you die, the matter that comprises your body and the energy that comprises your consciousness will remain. They will just be transferred into other forms. Humans have no reason to ever encounter nothingness, and thus we have no physiological or psychological equipment to truly observe and comprehend nothingness. When we're given a true blank, our instinct is to fill it. And that right there is the true danger of SCP-3930, and the very reason we have to deal with screamers. Or, as you may know them, pattern screamers. That's right. If this whole setup seemed awfully familiar to you, it's because SCP-3930 is the absolute global epicenter of pattern screamers. The hateful entities we've encountered before in anomalies like SCP-000. Nothingness is the natural environment of pattern screamers. But because SCP-3930 is the only place where true nothingness exists on our layer of reality, it's also the only place where pattern screamers are able to directly interact with humans if they become powerful and defined enough, often to deadly and terrifying results. Pattern screamers are an incredibly difficult concept to wrap your head around sometimes, but allow us to explain. Close your eyes again, and this time, Picture a clown, not a specific clown like Ronald McDonald or Pennywise. You have to make up your own clown. Let's say he's got green hair, a big blue rubber nose, a wide smile, and polka dot clown shoes. The other details are up to you. Go as simple or as complicated as you like, as long as it's an entirely new clown you've never seen in real life. Now hold the image in your head. Really focus on it. You can even use your imagination to make him dance or walk around. Fundamentally, this clown does not exist. Aside from being the product of chemical and electrical processes in your brain, if this is indeed an entirely new clown in your mind, it exists only on the level of thought. Now imagine if this clown in your mind was somehow aware of the fact it wasn't real, and that it was only the product of your imagination. Imagine that this clown is infuriated by that fact. It despises you for bringing it into being, doomed to be a concept straddling existence and non-existence. Imagine this clown wants to hurt you. It really, 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 really wants to hurt you with every fiber of its non-existent being. That right there is a pattern screamer. And the frightening thing about SCP-3930 is that if enough people observe it directly, these pattern screamers can become real. They can crawl out of nothing, and then they can show you exactly how they feel about you bringing them into existence. And when they're done, you'll probably regret ever existing in the first place. Think of them as hostile, sentient hallucinations capable of reaching maximum power around SCP-3930. This is because when humans are given a lack of stimulus, their minds simply create their own. This is why people believe they see the forest simply continuing into the anomalous zone. It's the only way the mind can comprehend what's going on here. It's like the phenomenon of periodolia. Humans have a natural tendency to see patterns in things, even if they were never really there. It's from these very patterns that the pattern screamers gain both their form and their name. They're monsters that we create, cursed to live hellish half-existences, and they hate us for it. 
Dr. Vasiliev described SCP-3930 as a kind of hateful mirror that reflects back the ugliest shards of our own minds, first broken in the futile quest to comprehend the true nature of nothingness. Thousands have likely been lost inside SCP-3930, if we can even call them lost, as lost implies that something is still out there, somewhere even if we never actually find it. This cannot be said for the victims of SCP-3930. They are nowhere and nothing. They can't be found again because there is nothing to find. The Foundation has used D-Class personnel to perform manned recon missions into SCP-3930, feeding information back to the few members of Mission Control permitted to be aware of SCP-3930's existence without immediate termination. The D-Classes have ventured well into the heart of nothingness, even reaching and entering the building that can be seen in the distance. There they found messes of haunting inconsistencies. The place looks like it's been abandoned for decades but also as evidence of recent habitation. Doors and windows move. Curtains and hallways go on forever. They feel a sound in their ears that's similar to the screech of TV static. No, not a screech. Really more of a scream. It's always in that moment that the realization hits them. They don't exist. Not anymore. And they haven't for a little while now. They're just a few scattered memories of the Foundation researcher talking to them, reflected back by SCP-3930's hateful mirror. And moments later, they're gone, almost like they were never here at all. So if ever anyone asks you what is SCP-3930, you know there's only ever one answer. SCP-3930 does not exist. Welcome back, comrade. The case of SCP-2273, also known as Major Alexei Belitrov, has sparked your imagination, and you need to know more. But even if you're not familiar with the Major, his story, all you need to know is that it's one of war, tragedy, and alternate dimensions. He first appeared in the town of Danner, Wisconsin, on the 13th of October 1989, during an unprecedented seismic event. When he was first discovered, the Foundation researchers assumed that he was an extraterrestrial being on account of his advanced organic exoskeleton. In a surprising move for such an imposing creature, Belitrov gave himself up to Foundation agents without a fight. Major Belitrov was then impounded in Foundation Containment Site 17, where he was interrogated thoroughly. Over a series of interviews, the Foundation ascertained that Belitrov came from an alternate timeline where Russia and the US are locked in a so-called war to end the world thanks to advanced military technology given to them by SCP-1000. Belitrov had nearly escaped execution at the hands of American soldiers and appeared in our timeline. Now he is a prisoner of the advanced suit that formerly kept him alive. But his story isn't over. The last remnant of a Cold War turned hot has plenty left to teach us. Something that you need to understand about the SCP Foundation before we go any further is that it doesn't only exist in every nation across the globe. It also exists in every splinter reality across the multiverse. And these splinter realities offer a countless multitude of tales, of different places, different people, and different times. Today's tale concerns Major Belitrov's future in a universe where the secrecy of the Foundation is broken and the anomalous world needs to find a way to fit in with our own. The year was 2018. Like many humanoid anomalies that the Foundation was holding in this timeline, Belitrov was released from containment. He was no longer an SCP. He was now a mere person of interest, free to move around as he pleased. But this didn't mean Belitrov was about to enjoy a quiet life on Easy Street. He was still an interdimensional refugee from a broken alternate world. Thankfully, there was a certain group willing to help, the Mana Charitable Foundation. This anomalous charity has been involved in a number of strange cases investigated by the Foundation before, and now they were going to lend a hand to Major Belitrov. Thanks to their anomaly reintegration project, Mana was able to transport Belitrov back to his home of Volograd in Russia. There, he became something of a national celebrity, making headlines across the country, sitting down for interviews on every Russian talk show, and even being offered book deals. But as a former military man, Belitrov was eager to return to government life and run for a government position. However, this ambition didn't go very far. Belitrov was rejected by all the government bodies he applied to, 
Even Vladimir Putin wasn't eccentric enough to want an insectoid cyborg from another dimension in his cabinet. Belotrov endured a rough two years in Volgrad. He was treated more like a sideshow freak than a human being. People didn't want to rent apartments to him, and he was never able to find permanent employment. Even entry-level jobs rejected him. Nobody wanted to get food served to them by what looked to be a seven-foot monster, and he seemed equally ill-suited to help Russian women find the right perfume in department stores. In April of 2020, Belotrov had finally had enough. He contacted the MANA Charitable Foundation once again and asked to be relocated. They told him that some religious institutions in the area, including the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church, were accepting and housing anomalous refugees. Not long after this, Belotrov truly fell off of the SCP Foundation's radar. But one former Foundation operative was well aware of Major Belotrov's fate. It's 2021. Dr. Friedrich, the Site-17 anomaly psychologist who'd conducted all the initial interviews with Belotrov all the way back in 1989, started receiving letters from him. There was no indication as to his true location, and they appeared to have been handled by a MANA Charitable Foundation mail carrier in Russia. But Dr. Friedrich was happy to hear from an old friend nonetheless. Due to a career of working near highly radioactive anomalies like Belotrov, Dr. Friedrich was suffering from terminal lymphoma. It seemed almost like an act of divine providence that Belotrov's letters would come to him so close to the end. The two began a correspondence, and it was only after Dr. Friedrich's eventual death that the letters came to the SCP Foundation's attention. It was from this final correspondence that the Foundation was able to answer the big question. Whatever happened to Major Alexei Belotrov? In his first letter to Dr. Friedrich, Belotrov thanked him profusely. He knew that Dr. Friedrich had been a crucial part of him gaining freedom from the Foundation, and credited the therapeutic techniques taught to him by Dr. Friedrich with keeping him alive and sane to this day. Belotrov expressed a mix of amazement at this brave new world and a sense of profound weariness. As a man eternally locked into a weapon of war, he felt unsuited to a world in peacetime. He almost missed the scorched, irradiated Russia of his home dimension. But most of all, he missed Site-17. He missed Dr. Friedrich. He missed some of his fellow anomalies like SCP-507, the teleporting man, and SCP-163, the spacecraft. He even missed the simplicity of being contained. He hoped that Dr. Friedrich would write back. In his second letter, Belotrov began detailing his experience with the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church. Despite growing up in a highly atheistic communist environment, Belotrov became enamored with the ways of the church. He found them to be highly accepting of him in spite of his unfortunate circumstances. They displayed a freedom in their faith that Belotrov had never encountered before, and he was eager to be a part of it. With the help of Dr. Friedrich, Belotrov was also sending letters to some of his fellow freed anomalies. He signed off by saying that he had even started praying, something he'd never considered before. The next letter, sent in 2027, struck a much more somber tone. It was sent shortly after Belotrov discovered Dr. Friedrich's diagnosis. He wanted to return and see the doctor one more time, but the MANA Charitable Foundation wouldn't allow him to return to Site-17 believing he had been abused during his time there. Belotrov gave Frederick his prayers and well wishes, and asked for a number through which he could contact his ailing old friend. By the time the next letter arrived in 2034, Belotrov had become a fully-fledged member of the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church. He referred to the other monks at the monastery as his brothers and sisters. He seemed to have finally found a true home there, and the others fondly referred to him by the nickname Father Anvil. But the true heart of the letter is Belotrov's deep concern for Dr. Friedrich's health. Notably in this letter, he often refers to Dr. Friedrich by his first name, Thomas, as though to emphasize the urgency of the message. After the deaths of several of the anomalies that Belotrov considered friends, he stated that he couldn't handle losing anyone else. His letter ends with a poignant passage. You may be unmarried, Dr. Friedrich, but you are not unloved. You have to be strong for me. You have to be strong for yourself. If you're ever worried that you cannot find the strength to continue, think of the garden you'll plant this spring. I'd like to share gardening photos with you again. Not many of my brothers and sisters here appreciate the simple beauty of a flower bed, or the effort that goes into growing a patch of vegetables. It's a beauty I'd like to continue to share. Trust in the power of our Lord, Thomas. 
and trust in the power of modern medicine. God is smiling on you. Please, be strong. With love and prayers, Alexei Belitrov. This letter arrived on the 15th of February, 2034. Sadly, Dr. Friedrich had already passed away four days earlier. He never got to see Alexei's final letter, and it truly was his final letter. With nobody left for him in the world, Major Belitrov stopped sending any correspondence. What we know about the final years of Belitrov's life all comes from a few scattered journal entries, translated from Russian after his passing. They provide clues as to the kind of life he lived during the 29 years the Foundation could not account for his whereabouts and his actions. The first entry, written on January 7, 2035, paints a grim picture of Belitrov feeling broken and isolated in the monastery. He wrote, Today is the day that our monastery celebrates the birth of our Lord. However, I feel no desire to celebrate. All of my friends in this world are dead. My brothers and sisters are partaking in some celebration outside my dormitory. All of the required ceremonies are complete. Neither they nor whatever is happening out there will lighten my mood. Belitrov also wrote about losing the comfort he once had in his faith and his doubts about whether he would be able to recapture that comfort. But he had survived greater traumas than this, and he would continue to press on. As the months turned to years and the years turned to decades, Belitrov climbed through the ranks of the monastery. Seeing as the Eastern Clockwork Orthodox Church practically worshipped the concepts of industrialization and mechanization, the fact that Belitrov was permanently encased in a biomechanical exoskeleton probably made him seem even more pious to his holy brethren. The final piece of evidence collected by the Foundation into the life and times of Alexei Belitrov came just over 20 years later, in a final address written to comfort his followers in preparation for his own death. Belitrov recounted the details of his own life, being born into a world of fire, death, and mushroom clouds. Then his life being suddenly saved by forces beyond his control, only to place him into containment for almost 30 years. It was only after accepting the teachings of the church and accepting the clockwork goddess that he felt he was truly free from his past. In this final note, Belitrov lay out some of the teachings of his new religion, the belief in a great mechanized goddess who planned all of reality. According to Belitrov, everything in her design fits together perfectly, like cogs in a machine, turning and twisting in unison to create an ideal world. He hoped to be forgiven for the many violent sins he committed in his military life and that his contributions to this new world were valuable. At the very end of his address, Belitrov wrote, I do not believe that my time in this world is much longer. Brothers and sisters, when my time of judgment comes, do not mourn me. I would rather you remember these words. The goddess is most pleased with those who seek kind, non-violent resolution to their problems. Because a machine whose gears grind against each other is a machine that cannot work. See truth, but also compassion. The words are only words. Seek out truth within them. God bless you all, Father Anvil. A month after authoring this statement, records indicate that Alexei Belitrov was found dead in his room, having passed away peacefully in his sleep from natural causes. He lived a warrior's life, but died a humble priest's death. The true tragedy in the strange life of Major Alexei Belitrov is how little choice he had in his circumstances, but thanks to this tale, we know he did what he could with the life he was given. His remains lay within the graveyard at the Eastern Clockwork Orthodoxy Monastery, where he spent the last years of his life. With a life as difficult as his own, we can only imagine he's glad to finally rest. There is something inherently unnerving about the sight of someone wearing a gas mask. Maybe it's the wide, soulless portholes where a person's eyes should be, or the huge, round filter extruding from their face that makes them look like something inhuman. It could also be the fact that if ever you see someone wearing a gas mask, you may be surrounded by poisonous gas. And if you're not wearing one yourself, someone else's gas mask may be the last thing you ever see. Whatever the reason, you might be wondering why we're talking so much about gas masks. Well, that's because you're about to meet SCP-1499, which is, as you might have already guessed, 
an anomalous gas mask. For all you military history buffs out there, SCP-1499 is specifically a Soviet GP-5 gas mask. These were produced between 1962 and 1990 as a way to protect the wearer from the fallout of a nuclear blast. Back then, during the Cold War, an atomic conflict between the United States and the USSR, that's Russia, was a constant threat. And so these masks were sent to most of the fallout shelters in the Soviet Union. While the GP-5 masks could survive in all weather and protect against radioactive substances for a time, some of their filters contained a number of harmful chemicals like lead and asbestos. The fact that these gas masks were airtight would mean that somebody could end up inhaling these toxic chemicals while trying to protect themselves from nuclear fallout. If you look up the definition of irony in the dictionary, you may see a picture of one of these gas masks sitting right next to it. And if you think that sounds bad, just wait until you hear what sets SCP-1499 apart from the rest. Upon first inspection, the mask still seems to perform its original function. The filter works properly, and the airtight seal is still formed when placed upon somebody's head. However, when worn by someone, the anomalous effects of SCP-1499 will also activate. While it doesn't fuse to the wearer's face and turns them into a hysterical zombie chillingly asking for their mommy, the gas mask does cause anyone who puts it on to completely disappear from view. Now it's worth noting that this isn't a gas mask that grants its user the power of invisibility. If that was the case, this anomalous item may actually be desirable. SCP-1499 instead causes a person to physically vanish as in they are no longer detectable at all. Subjects that have worn SCP-1499 report that they don't feel any sensation of moving. They simply put the mask on and end up, well, we'll get to where it is they go. You see, through testing, the SCP Foundation's researchers were able to determine that giving someone a two-way radio before they put SCP-1499 on means that they can still be contacted after they vanish. And it's through these radios that the Foundation discovered where the mask wearers go. During testing, subjects have reportedly found themselves in a strange alternate dimension after putting on SCP-1499. It has been described as a dark environment, inhospitable, barren, and filled with tall, black tower-like structures. You would think being unceremoniously transported to another dimension by a gas mask would be bad enough. Just wait until you meet the locals. According to a number of test subjects, a group of humanoid entities inhabit this dimension, designated as SCP-1499-1. These creatures are taller than the average person, completely nude and covered from head to toe in a coat of a dark, viscous substance unlike anything found in our dimension. These SCP-1499-1 entities also have been described as having too many mouths and a large number of eyes covering their bodies. From the sound of it, the whole place makes the upside down from Stranger Things sound like a pleasant destination for a family vacation. For the record, the reason we say according to a number of test subjects is that there has never been any photographic or video evidence of this place and the creatures that inhabit it. All that we have gathered to date has come strictly from first-hand descriptions of those experiencing the anomalous effects of SCP-1499. Luckily, anyone that puts on SCP-1499 and finds themselves in this place has a very quick and easy escape route. Should a subject encounter any danger in this dark, inhospitable dimension, then taking the gas mask off will drop them right back into our own plane of existence. Upon arriving back, they will not have moved from the spot they were standing in when they first disappeared. But it is unknown exactly how the gas mask is able to return them, or indeed how it can send someone to an entirely different dimension at all. So a gateway to another dimension, that's what the mask is. The Foundation has been running tests on SCP-1499 since they first acquired it, at first using D-Class personnel. The first test involving SCP-1499 saw a D-Class, D-67393, told to put on the mask. When she did, she found herself transported inside a building that was constructed from an unknown black substance. D-67393 surveyed the room she was in for a few seconds, 
only to hear something moving close by. The sound caused her to panic, and she retched the gas mask off her face, returning to the test chamber. Given that there was now a risk of losing SCP-1499, the Foundation moved forward with tests involving trained agents instead of D-Class personnel. Following this, the next test involved an Agent C putting on the mask, and like the D-Class before him, he found himself in the same dark room. But instead of taking off SCP-1499 at the first sign of trouble, this agent explored his surroundings. Agent C was able to descend the building to a reasonable degree until he heard sounds coming from the floor below. After hiding himself, Agent C witnessed the very first sighting of the SCP-1499-1 creatures, remaining undetected and then safely removing the mask when the creatures had passed. Another agent, known as Agent Yu, was selected for an SCP-1499 test, chosen especially for her extensive training in stealth. Like those before her, she put on the gas mask. Instantly, she found herself in the place where her predecessor had left off, and continued the exploration of the building, detecting movement from the floors above. Agent Yu exited the building and spotted a number of SCP-1499-1 instances. The creatures were mulling aimlessly around, each sporting their own unique mutations, occasionally uttering low, grating noises. By now, if they were still using D-classes, they probably would have lost the mask and the people wearing it a hundred times over. Never get a D-class to do a field agent's job. Making her way past more of the tall, dark structures, the agent followed and observed a group of four creatures. A fifth approached them, prompting one from the group to step forward. As Agent Yu watched, these SCP-1499-1 creatures began violently assaulting each other, until she too pulled the gas mask off and returned to the Foundation. Shortly afterward, one final agent, Agent K, was sent into this alternate dimension. This was less of a test, more a mission, with the purposes of reconnaissance, to give the Foundation a better, clearer idea of what the environment was like and to possibly even make contact with the SCP-1499-1s and understand them better. However, the outcome that followed could not have been worse. Agent K appeared in the other dimension between two of the black structures. The lighting made it difficult to see much of the environment around him, but he remarked that the buildings resembled tall spires constructed out of hard rock, as was the ground beneath him. After a few short minutes, he soon spotted a group of SCP-1499-1s entering a larger structure, an elaborate building with a number of towers and spikes on it, as well as what appeared to be blood. Approaching the building with caution, Agent K located a small secluded side entrance, away from the larger front door. As quietly as he could, he made his way inside. The sounds of grinding filled the air from all around him, as Agent K saw a huge group of the mutated humanoid creatures. Each one had their mouth wide open, all of their mouths wide open, making a chorus of grating sounds. The entities were, according to K's description, all facing towards one of the SCP-1499-1s that was standing on a platform in front of them, with a number of bodies around it. This creature seemed to be leading an odd ritual, and began to cut open its own torso. Worm-like creatures spilled out of the open womb, and a beam of light followed, projecting out of the entity's chest. Agent K realized that this light was some form of portal. Another worm, like the kind that had come out of the ritual leader's chest, began to appear in the portal. Deciding to act, Agent K dashed out from his hiding place, opening fire at the creatures all around him. He reached for something glowing in the lead entity's chest, which he thought was bringing the worm creature through the portal. Grabbing it, Agent K pulled off the gas mask and found himself back at the Foundation, holding a human heart. But it doesn't end there. At the exact same time, on the exact same date, a man attacked the Cathedral of Christ the Savior in Moscow, Russia. During the church's morning services, the gunman entered dressed in a suit with a gas mask over his face and proceeded to shoot ten civilians. Six were killed, three left in critical condition including the church's chanter. However, the worst occurred to the priest performing the service. The attacker ran to the front of the cathedral, producing a knife which he used to cut open the priest's chest and remove his heart. Then, just as quickly as he had appeared, the assailant vanished before the eyes of multiple witnesses, and Moscow police were unable to find any trace of the man. Officially, the cathedral was attacked by Nikolai Orlov, 
Undercover Foundation operatives inside Russia's media and military have spread this cover story of a violent man who acted alone in his attack on the church. Meanwhile, the SCP Foundation is keeping Agent K detained, questioning him about his involvement in the incident. According to him, everything happened exactly as he described it. No church, no priest, just him wearing SCP-1499 and surrounded by the creatures. The audio recordings taken from his exploration mission also seem to align with this story, but that still doesn't explain how another figure in a gas mask appeared in Moscow and claimed the lives of multiple churchgoers. Not only that, but dispatching them in the exact same way Agent K dealt with the SCP-1499-1 creatures. The only possible explanation was that Agent K was the perpetrator, even if, in his mind, he was still telling the truth. Hoping to avoid another incident, the O5 Council has suspended all further testing with SCP-1499. Agent K has been scheduled to undergo a psychological evaluation, believing the creature he saw being summoned had to be stopped at all costs. The other agents and the D-Class involved in earlier testing are all being brought in for questioning as well. It is still unknown what the anomalous effect of SCP-1499 truly is. Is it actually capable of transporting someone to another dimension? Or does it give a person hallucinations that make them think they're gallivanting off in Dimension X, while they're actually walking up to a church about to do something unthinkable? With testing suspended, we may never know but it leaves us with an important message. Think carefully about everything you do, because what you think you can see doesn't always reflect what's really there. The diver screams a silent scream as the giant squid's beak digs into his skin, its many grasping tentacles grabbing him and holding him in place. Nearby, his fellow divers are driven half mad with terror as they see mysterious figures floating towards them through the murk and strange Russian voices speaking in their heads. Nobody can help them. They're down too deep, too consumed by the darkness and the pressure of the sea. They're now at the mercy of whatever is inside the submarine. Beginning in the 1940s, with the dawn of nuclear weapons, the American government conducting the world's first atomic weapons test, and the Soviet Union responding in kind with nuclear testing of their own, the two powers entered an arms race fueled by rivalry and a thirst to prove their strength on the world stage. What followed were decades of staggering technological advancements as each nation tried to outdo and intimidate the other. The Soviet Union crossed into the cold reaches of outer space, deploying the satellite Sputnik. The United States responded with the founding of NASA. Tensions reached a fever pitch during the Cuban Missile Crisis of 1962 as United States citizens feared they were teetering on the brink of nuclear war. In July of 1968, the Soviet Union, the United Kingdom, and the United States came together to sign the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, agreeing to abandon their pursuit of increasing nuclear power and turn their focus to disarmament. But several months before the treaty was signed, the Soviet government was dealing in weaponry far more dangerous than nuclear missiles something the other world powers knew nothing about. These deadly secrets were hidden aboard a submarine known as SCP-741. SCP-741 is the underwater wreckage of a Soviet submarine that sank in March of 1968 and came into the custody of the SCP Foundation in 1999. The submarine, a version of the Charlie II class, was deployed under unusual circumstances, which attracted the attention of the United States government. In an attempt to learn more about the submarine, the US government launched Project Redacted, which attempted to recover the vessel from the ocean in the early 1970s. They managed to recover a few pieces of the vessel, though the specifics are highly classified. In the late 1990s, the US government contacted the SCP Foundation, informing them of a possible Euclid or Keter class anomaly in the wreck. At this point, it passed into the custody and surveillance of the Foundation. The submarine is on the ocean floor, broken into three pieces. The hull was broken into bits during Project Redacted recovery attempt, but was largely intact when it first sank except for two holes, one just in front of the sail and one just below the starboard missile tubes. Apparently, the vessel sank rapidly due to flooding after an enemy missile strike, which occurred while it was surfacing. Though all parts of the submarine are accounted for, no members of the crew have been located. 
Additionally, none of the emergency escape equipment on board has been used, raising further questions about what became of the crew. Wherever they went, they seem to have left something behind. Whenever divers are sent down to investigate the wreckage, they report experiencing anomalous currents and strange sea life, and hearing moans, disembodied voices, and incoherent whispering. They also report seeing blurry, faintly glowing figures. Additionally, the ocean life in the area is unnaturally aggressive, particularly large squid and sharks. This effect was first noted during a manned expedition into the waters around the wreckage, described in Incident Report 1741-A. Divers A26 through A30 embarked from the icebreaker Yamal into the waters below with the intention of studying the potential anomalous activity surrounding the wreckage. As the group of divers approached the submarine, they could feel the shift in the water around them. The oppressive feeling of abnormally increasing pressure bearing down and threatening to crush them. If their specialized diving equipment were to fail, they knew that that would be it, and the command would have to come and fish their corpses out of the water. Or even worse, they would vanish entirely, meeting the same mysterious fate as the crew of that doomed submarine. But they couldn't fixate on that. They had a job to do. At first glance, the wreckage appeared undisturbed, unchanged since the previous inspection. Still, they needed to take a closer look to be sure. As the team got closer to the vessel, A-30 was startled by the sight of movement from within the wreckage, spotting motion through one of the holes in the structure as something passed by. He pointed it out to his colleagues, but they dismissed it as likely a giant isopod or spider crab, which were crawling all over the surrounding area. A-30 laughed off his jumpiness, agreed that they were probably right, and continued the exploration as planned. Control authorized the divers to proceed to the next step and A-29 activated sonar and lights, moving toward the starboard side breach. There, a faint glowing caught his eye. The glow resembled that of radioactive material, but when the team checked the radiation levels in the area, they remained stable. Whatever the source of the glow was, it wasn't radioactive. At this point, his neutron counter began to register something, and all of a sudden, a disembodied voice could be heard saying, Vasily Yevgeny, can you hear me? The voice was muffled, and though it could be heard over their communication channels, it emanated from somewhere in the wreckage, deep, deep underwater. As A-29 watched, a glowing shape emerged from the darkness. It was only an outline, the suggestion of a silhouette, but the shape was undeniably familiar. It looked like a person. The other divers quickly noted the apparition too and began to panic. Some checked their nitrogen levels, believing it to be some sort of nitrogen narcosis, while others pointed out that they couldn't all be suffering from nitrogen narcosis at the same time. The unknown voice continued speaking, saying, Help me, it is getting hard to breathe. The divers debated what to do next, questioning whether what they were seeing was even real, when all at once, the humanoid figure vanished from sight. The divers attempted to shake off the startling encounter, and they resumed their duties, the investigation proceeding as normal. After a few moments of uneventful work, another interruption presented itself in the form of a five-meter-long squid swimming around the wreckage. Its presence startled the divers at first, particularly those closest to the animal, but the others encouraged them to ignore it, citing the fact that there are no records of these squid attacking humans. So they did, continuing their work as the squid circled them with apparent curiosity. A-27 spotted an unusual shell below the wreckage, notably large and difficult to identify, and Control requested that they bring it up to the surface for further inspection by a marine biologist. The diver began attaching haul cables to the shell as the squid crept closer and closer. All of a sudden, A-26 screamed, and there was a sudden bloom of blood in the water. The squid, despite it being uncharacteristic behavior for its species, attacked the diver, biting him savagely. Prompted by cries for help from the diving team, Control began to reel A-26 back towards the surface, proceeding slowly to give him decompression time, and the squid took advantage of the slow retreat. It chased after the diver, grabbing hold of him and biting down again, tearing away at him as it gripped him in its tentacles. Still, Control continued reeling him in, hoping to free him from the squid's grasp as they yanked him to the surface. The other divers were ordered to get themselves out of there as fast as possible, an order they gladly obeyed. As they swam back to the surface, A-30 saw something else moving in the depths. He couldn't make out what it was, 
but the sight of it gave him a sick feeling of dread deep in the pit of his stomach. The four divers were recovered alive, along with the shell. Examination of the shell indicated that it resembled that of the extinct orthoconic nautiloids, but it was not fossilized. It was taken for further study, given the possible implication of extinct species anomalously manifesting in the vicinity of SCP-714. Diver A-26 lost a limb and was exposed to an unknown venom via bites from the attacking squid. His camera was destroyed in the process. As squid are not known to attack humans unprovoked, this behavior has been attributed to the influence of SCP-741, though the exact link between the two is yet to be determined. An anomalous pressure gradient surrounds the wreck with a radius of approximately 250 meters, starting around the center of the submarine. The pressure in this area is much greater than it should be, given the depth of the waters there. This unusually high pressure makes sonar analysis extremely difficult, as well as threatening the safety of any divers in the vicinity of the wreck. The few records that the Foundation has managed to obtain from the Russian and U.S. governments indicate that the submarine was being used to transport some sort of secret cargo. Though the specifics of this cargo are still unknown, there is reason to believe that it differed from any type of nuclear or chemical weaponry. On a date redacted from official files, the SCPS Basisti was patrolling the area around SCP-741 when its sonar detected some unknown entity approaching SCP-741 from the south at a pace of 46 knots. The crew compared the acoustic signature of the contact with known submarines and torpedoes, but could not find a match. The Basisti attempted to reach the contact via sonar buoy drops and active sonar pings, but it did not respond. When the contact crossed into the total underwater exclusion zone, it became classified as hostile. At that point, the sonar recorded sounds of an undersea missile launch, and Basisti responded with the utmost urgency. The ship broke away from its original area and fired a Type 53 torpedo at the underwater threat. Fifteen seconds after the Basisti launched its torpedo, missiles of an unidentified configuration were seen breaking the water, flying at a height of 1.8 meters and a velocity of 0.92 Mach. The missiles did not emit any detectable radar, nor did they respond to any launch chaff or flares from the Basisti. Both of the missiles were engaged by Basisti's 3KN5 Kinsol surface-to-air missiles and Kashtan point defense systems, and were destroyed at 1,800 meters and 210 meters from impact, respectively. After the missiles were neutralized, the hostile vessel could be heard engaging in evasive maneuvers. At this point, there were four closely spaced explosions and the sound of a submarine disintegrating. The identity of the attacker, as well as its intention toward SCP-741, have not yet been determined. The incident resulted in the Foundation research team suggesting an expansion of the acoustic sensor net, as well as additional patrol and defense assets placed in the area. Additionally, they advised an acquisition of undersea retaliatory capability. The incident was classified Incident 1741-C. The sonar recordings from the SCPS Basisti during Incident 1741-C were taken for further analysis by the research team. The in-depth review revealed anomalous acoustic signatures that did not match up with any known forms of propulsion, including magnetohydrodynamic drive. Currently, the nature of the unidentified attacker remains a mystery, and it has not been attributed to any particular government or organization. Following the incident involving the SCPS Basisti, an American intelligence agent reached out to the Foundation, offering further insight into the secretive government programs looking into SCP-741. He agreed to sit for an interview with a Foundation researcher assigned to the project, on the condition that his identity remain protected. The SCP researcher's name is absent from the official file as well. The two men sat in a Foundation interview room, and the interviewer asked his informant why he chose to come forward, given the U.S. government had simply chosen to sit on this information for 30 years. You've seen those reports. Project Redacted. Now we know that part too. How the directors didn't make the connection is beyond me. That and the stuff the Redacted pulled up? Yeah, the other part you don't hear about is what some of the research team died of. And the crewmen we buried? Just uniforms. Also, the nuclear device we recovered wasn't a missile or torpedo warhead. It was a demolition charge. Does that make any sense? After all those clues, I had to come forward. Why the director and didn't is something I can't fully explain. This particular statement puzzled the Foundation researcher, raising questions he hadn't anticipated. Only uniforms? Did this mean that the sub had been unmanned? The informant replied, 
No, no, not unmanned. There were no bodies, but personal effects were everywhere, along with uniforms. There was some blood, human. Before you ask, on one of the torpedoes and a bit of skin where somebody probably crushed his hand load in the thing, just no bodies left. When I first looked into all this, I had no clue what the hell had gone on down there, but I started putting things together. The Foundation agent began to speculate based on the mounting evidence. Could it have been a Soviet weapons program? A deadly biological agent of some kind? No, no, it wasn't that. I thought maybe it could have been, so I dialed up some of my contacts at BioPreparent. Our spies wind up owing each other favors after a while, and they denied it vehemently. Not your usual cover-up baloney either, they clearly stated that whatever the sub was carrying, it wasn't theirs. They wanted no part of it. Sound like he was gonna puke when I mentioned Redacted. Doctor, do you have any idea what it takes to make a bioweapons researcher sick? Now that wasn't what really bugged me though. What really kept me awake at night was the KGB file that fell into our hands. They mentioned a covert op by the Soviet military against an internal unnamed faction to get rid of a quote, terrifying weapons that even the Soviet Union can't safely control. They wanted to lose it, whatever it was, or maybe fob it off onto the US. Of course, that all came to light right before the Iron Curtain fell, and given the atmosphere at the time, it was practically impossible to convince the directors that they weren't talking about nukes, and even once I did, they still didn't even think this was worthy of action. I mean, the redacted would probably have me hang for treason if they ever find me, but it was worth the risk. And by what I can gather, sounds like Russia thinks so too. Loaning you half the Pacific fleet and all. The interview continued after this point, but the rest of the conversation was considered irrelevant and stricken from the official file. The interview left the Foundation with more questions than answers, though they were more certain than ever that SCP-741 must be kept under strict containment procedures. Due to the object's location at the bottom of the sea, as well as the unusually elevated pressure around it, it is unlikely that many civilians will come into contact with it. However, as an extra protective measure, sonar and submersible monitoring is conducted on a periodic basis in order to verify that the wreckage has not been interfered with in any way. The Foundation contracted Russian warships, SCP Esposisti and Krasnoyarsk, has been selected for this purpose. If any unauthorized activity occurs in the area surrounding SCP-741, nuclear and conventional missiles may be deployed. Any movement of SCP-741 is grounds for an immediate nuclear strike. Whatever secrets SCP-741 holds, whatever it was transporting that was even more of an uncontrollable threat than nuclear warfare, they're better left alone down there, at the bottom of the sea. You're a new SCP Foundation researcher on tour of Site-17, familiarizing yourself with the location and its many anomalous inhabitants. It's the second largest Foundation containment site out there, and it's also the kind of job that most junior researchers dream of. Low-risk humanoid containment, baby. Most of the inhabitants in your sector are cordial, willing to comply with orders from staff and seem, for all intents and purposes, pretty much human. You pass from door to door, looking through the viewing hatch of each one. You can't believe what you're seeing. It's a wonderful who's who of anomalous humanoids. You see the wise, bearded face of SCP-343, known to some as God. You see the blue eyes and shining blonde hair of Iris, SCP-105 looking wistfully into a Polaroid picture. You see the tanned, melancholic face of Kane, SCP-073 as he stares off into the middle distance. Face after face after face passes. You can see yourself getting more familiar with each one. Yes, your time here will be… wait, was that Hitler? You stop and walk back to the door you just passed, where you can't help but stop and stare in disbelief. Yes. It's him. It's gotta be him. You recognize the unpleasant sneer, the hideous comb over, the silly little toothbrush mustache. The SCP Foundation seems to have Adolf Hitler, the former leader of the Third Reich in World War II, in active containment, and his designation is SCP-2430. You've seen killer toasters and masks that can take over people's minds, but you've never seen anything as surreal as this. You immediately run to your superior and ask how and why Hitler is in one of the Site-17 humanoid containment cells. Buckle in, because we can guarantee it's one of the most insane stories you've ever heard. It's late April, 1945, and the Soviets are rampaging through Nazi Germany, destroying everything in their path. 
The German forces have been nearly obliterated, and Hitler and the rest of his Reich Chancellery have retreated to a secure bunker beneath Berlin. There on April 30th, 10 days after his 56th birthday, Hitler died. This was truly unfortunate for the Soviets, as they wished to have had the chance to kill him themselves. Two days later, Soviet forces stormed the Führerbunker. It was little more than a formality at that point, as the news of Hitler's death had already gone public. By the time they arrived, all that was left of Hitler was a pile of mostly burned remains. A fitting end for someone who had caused the same cruel fate for so many others. They collected what was left of Hitler's body and brought it back to the fatherland, a kind of trophy for their nation. But Hitler dying before Joseph Stalin could get his hands on him was not what Stalin wanted. Hitler had not only caused the deaths of millions of Russians, he had personally betrayed Stalin's trust. And when you betray Stalin, bad things happen to you. Very, very bad things. Two years earlier, in 1943, Soviet forces had raided a camp in Genowiska, belonging to the Obscura Corps. Think of them as the Nazis' own version of the SCP Foundation, who were hell-bent on gathering anomalous people and artifacts to increase the power of the Third Reich. They were a far more militant offshoot of the Tule Society, a group that described itself as a study group for Germanic antiquity. While this may seem innocent, the Tule Society was actually a racist cult, closely aligned with the goals and ideas of the German Nazi party. Many have also speculated that they were heavily involved in the occult, and it's this mysticism-obsessed offshoot that went on to form the Obscura Corps. And in their Genoesca base, they'd obtained a hundred pieces of enchanted occult flesh with human skeletons embedded in each of them. This flesh was believed to originate from the mythological Serimnir, the beast hunted and eaten again and again by the pantheon of Norse gods having the qualities of both a wild boar and a goat. The flesh can bond to skeletons and give them a quality somewhat like immortality. Any flesh cut from them will regrow time and time again if given a rest period. Now that he had both the flesh of Serimnir and Hitler's burnt remains, Stalin had an idea. A perfect way to not only bring satisfaction to the Russian people and the world, but to finally exact the true revenge that Hitler had denied to him. He called it Project Judica, namely after the very bottom level of hell reserved for betrayers like Judas. A perfect tribute for an old ally turned enemy. He couldn't kill Hitler before, but if Stalin was going to get the chance, Hitler needed to live again. For years, Stalin's top scientists tried to use arcane methods to resurrect Hitler by combining his remains with the flesh of Suramir. At times, they even came close to creating a new Hitler. But there was one huge issue. The creature they created could not feel pain. And for Stalin's plans of violent and painful retribution, the lack of suffering simply would not do. They destroyed what they had created and went back to the drawing board. Stalin would stop at nothing to get what he wanted, even if it meant breaking every law of nature in the process. In order to make his twisted dream a reality, Stalin formed an unholy alliance with a group known as the Uralic Fleshcrafters, a neo-Sarkic cult that was a branch of the nightmarish religion of Sarkicism. This group essentially worships avatars of flesh, corruption, and disease, and are behind some of the most terrifying and disgusting anomalies out there including the flesh that hates and the bone orchard. True sarcasists who show the proper devotion to their vile deities and know the right rituals to contact them are often granted anomalous powers that spread the sarcic influence further across the known dimensions. These powers will usually involve having a supernatural ability to manipulate the flesh of themselves and others, allowing them to enhance their bodies, cheat death, and warp their enemies beyond repair. They can sometimes even create life if they're a powerful enough acolyte of sarcasism. And it was because of these powers that Stalin wanted the Uralic fleshcrafters under his command. In exchange for their participation, he would give them a vast quantity of the flesh of Suramir, which they could use for their own sinister sarcic purposes. A deal was struck, and the true work of resurrecting Hitler began. Stalin was very specific in his requirements. He gave the Uralic Fleshcrafters extra bones to compensate for what had gone missing from Hitler's burnt remains. He also gave them samples of the flesh of Saramir to achieve the desired effects of a near-immortal tolerance for damage. However, Stalin demanded that he heighten this new Hitler's capacity to experience pain. 
so that every suffering inflicted on him would be three times worse than anyone else. And true to their word, the flesh crafters got to work and began creating just such a creature. By now it was the early 1950s, and Stalin was putting the pieces in place for his grand revenge. Once the new Hitler was finished, he would hold a new trial for him in the Russian courts, where he would preside over the sentencing personally. Once the new Hitler was done, the Uralic Fleshcrafters were rewarded for their participation in Project Judica, with 4,000 kilograms of the flesh of Saramir. Stalin now had his very own personal Hitler chew toy, that he could maim and torture as much as he pleased, knowing that he would always heal and soon be ready for more. In their infinite generosity, the Fleshcrafters even taught Stalin a new method of torment for his old enemy, a process known as the Rite of Nyas. It's a torture that's been described by many as being like the Chinese Ling Chi, also known as the Lingering Death, or Slow Slicing, but it is probably best known as the Death by a Thousand Cuts. The Soviets and the Sarkics parted ways. For the next few years, Stalin took a great deal of pleasure in visiting Hitler's cage now and then to torture him, until Stalin himself eventually passed away from natural causes. The GRUP division, which is essentially the Soviet answer to the SCP Foundation, decided it would be best to do away with the immortal Hitler clone after Stalin's death. He no longer served any purpose, and no matter how hard they tried, they couldn't permanently kill him either. In the end, they settled on a kind of compromise. He would be buried alive and forgotten, forced to live a torturous eternity that he could never escape. Until, of course, he was dug up and rescued by none other than the members of Obscura, a modern splinter group of the original Obscura Corps. Like many high-profile Nazis who'd escaped the war, the new Hitler was spirited away to a safe house run by sympathizers in Argentina. The ones taking care of him received the following correspondence from the Obscura agents who'd first dug the new Hitler back up. We have managed to rescue the Fuhrer and bring him to safety, but he is effectively dead on the inside. I blame the Reds for their inhumane treatment of the Fuhrer, who may have been bewitched by the Reds' Wunderwaffe. I wish we could mercy kill him, but we've tried everything. He just won't perish. Don't abandon him. He's too distinct in plain sight. They didn't have the new Hitler for long, though. In 1960, efforts to hunt down the remaining Nazi fugitives increased in intensity. The new Hitler was soon captured by Mossad agents searching for Nazis in Buenos Aires, and then remanded to the containment of the SCP Foundation when they realized that he had a number of anomalous properties, such as his incredible regenerative abilities, as well as the fact that his DNA seems to be based on that of a wild boar and a goat rather than a human. However, x-rays conducted by the Foundation have discovered traces of cyanide still in his system, as well as traces of lead in his skull where the bone has regrown over the bullet. In other words, it was unquestionably the real Hitler, and he was now in Foundation custody forevermore. It's such a wild story even by Foundation standards that you can barely summon the words to respond once your supervisor is finished. He just stands there with a slight smile, basking in your amazement. Before you can even ask again, he confirms the facts one more time. Yes, it is the real Hitler, the only functional difference is that he can't die and he has a heightened sense of pain compared to most people. You think on what you've been told for just a moment, and then you have only one question. Are we allowed to punch him? Your supervisor smiles and says, Of course, we all do. The war that ended the world started on October 9th, 1971. Tensions had been brewing for years between America and the Soviet Union. And even though people had done their best to keep a sense of normalcy, everyone was wondering when the Cold War that had been brewing for the past 30 years would boil over. There were those who had been preparing for it for years, while others assumed that it would never amount to anything. Neither nation wanted to make the first nuclear strike, and even if that happened, the engineers would come out of their underground cities to intervene. But nobody knew for sure if the two world superpowers could ever come to an agreement or if it would all end in total destruction. October 9th was the day that question was finally answered. The first American nuclear warhead detonated over the Gulf of Finland, only a few miles away from the city of Leningrad, where people were going about their day blissfully unaware of the destruction that was about to befall them. First came a citywide blackout, as the power grid was bombarded with a huge surge of radiation that caused bulbs to blow and wires to glow like they'd been struck by lightning. 
there was barely any time to react before the next wave hit. A white hot flash so bright that many of those who couldn't get to cover were blinded. The third wave, by far the most destructive, was the force of the explosion itself. Like a powerful burning wind, it swept through the city, breaking windows, knocking over streetlights, ripping the leaves off trees, and bathing every car, building, and person with ash. People are trapped under the debris as some of the city's older, less well-maintained buildings come crumbling down. Even though the Soviet government had been preparing for this day to come, and the Russian people had been put through mandatory safety drills, no amount of practice or planning could have prepared them for the real thing. The streets erupted into chaos. Cars were crashing into buildings, either because their drivers had been blinded by the light of the distant explosion, or because the initial wave of radiation had shorted their batteries. People nearly trampled each other trying to get to underground shelters, as police and military tried to yell directions over the cacophony. Among the crowd, a family desperately tried to stay together. Irina and Nikolai Belotrov held tight to their children, Alexei and Tatiana. The whole family was still in their pajamas and barely had time to get their shoes on before they started rushing towards the neighborhood's designated underground bunker. Irina had Tatiana, who was only two, clutched tight to her chest, and Nikolai tried his best to keep 10-year-old Alexei's eyes shielded as they walked past the dead bodies of people who were once their friends and neighbors. It will be all right soon, son, Nikolai said, as much as to try and convince himself as his son. We're going underground, just like in the safety drills. Alexei nodded solemnly and kept his gaze straight ahead. They were almost at the end of the street, when just above the sounds of air raid sirens and screaming people, Alexei heard a familiar voice. Alexei! Alexei! The boy looked down to see his teacher, Mr. Petrov, trapped in the wreckage of his car. He must have been driving to work when the bomb struck. Father, stop! Alexei yelled, tugging at his father's shirt sleeve. That's my teacher! We have to help him or he won't make it to the shelter! The soldiers will help him once everyone else is in, said Nikolai. Alexei didn't listen. He wriggled free of his father's grip and ran to where his teacher lay pinned under the wrecked vehicle. Nikolai was calling after him, and though Irina wanted to wait for Alexei to come back, she was swept up in the tide of people and separated from her husband. Mr. Petrov was crying, thanking Alexei for coming to his aid. As Alexei got closer, he saw there was blood pooling out from under the wreck. It seemed if Mr. Petrov were going to make it out, his legs would likely be badly damaged. Alexei tried to lift the car himself, but even though he was strong for his age, he was still only a child. A soldier who had been helping people into the bomb shelter stopped what he was doing and ran over to Alexei. A kid! The soldier shouted. Leave him alone and go back to your family! You're going to hurt yourself! Alexei kicked and struggled against the soldier's grip as he was dragged back into the line with his family. But he's in trouble! Alexei cried. It's not your job to save him! His father scolded as he took his hand and led him down the stairs where they would rejoin his mother and sister. As Alexei and his father descended into the tunnels, Alexei heard a gunshot from the street above. Though he would survive long after that day, he never saw his teacher, Mr. Petrov, again. He never asked his father about what happened. The Belotrov family was reunited in the underground shelter, which had once been an underground train station. Tatiana had started crying, and Nikolai tried desperately to quiet her. Irina hugged her son so tight, he felt she might squeeze the life out of him. They were packed in with a dozen other families, some they knew and others who were strangers. Alexei recognized some of the other children from school, and saw that some were there without their parents. While they were in the station, a soldier addressed the group and explained what would happen next. The train station was to serve as their temporary shelter until the proper negotiations were made with the engineers. As per a treaty that had been written and signed after the Second World War, the engineers had agreed to open the borders of their underground civilization to humans fleeing from a crisis above ground. Once the government had made a decision, the survivors were to be taken deep underground, where they would live until the war was over. Above ground, the Soviet Union began dealing with the fallout of the initial attack. It was clear that America could no longer be dealt with reasonably if they were willing to bomb one of the USSR's biggest cities. Though the bombing had cut communications between Leningrad and Moscow, eventually contact was re-established, and the army was able to radio the Kremlin with a full report on the damage. Leningrad was in ruin with over a third of the population dead or otherwise too wounded to move underground. Those who had made it underground 
were receiving treatment from everything from broken bones and blindness to radiation poisoning. In a word, it was chaos. Russian parliament was quick and ruthless in their decision to strike back. On October 12th, Secretary Brezhnev authorized nuclear missiles to be launched at both New York City and Washington, D.C. Millions were killed, and just like in Russia, the survivors retreated underground. America didn't go down without a fight, though, and launched another missile attack, this time at Moscow. It wasn't long before both countries' allies were involved in the conflict as well, with missile strikes coming from France, China, North Korea, Germany, and the United Kingdom. Within a month, the surface of the Earth was dangerously irradiated, and any humans who were still living had retreated underground. But though the world had ended, the war had not. Alexei Belotrov and his family struggled to adjust to their new life underground. Though the engineers were intelligent and human-like, their world was so different from the world Alexei had lived in for the first ten years of his life. He barely ever saw them. The engineers were nocturnal, sleeping while an artificial sun nourished the genetically engineered plants that grew around the city. But any time he tried to ask questions about them, he was met with hushed silence by the adults. The engineers were spoken of in hushed, almost reverent tones. They were the beings that saved humanity, yes, but they had also helped build the weapons that led to the war in the first place. Alexei barely had any time to settle into this new life before what remained the Russian army started looking for new recruits. Reports had come in from an above-ground scout that the Americans were working on a new type of armor that could fully shield the wearer against radiation, and the Soviets could not afford to be outmatched when their army was still recovering from multiple nuclear attacks. But the army wasn't asking for able-bodied adult men to enlist, they were looking for children. We can't possibly send our son to war, Irina said. Arguments at the dinner table had become common in the Belotrov family. He would not be going to war, Nikolai argued. Not until their new anti-radiation technology is perfected. He won't be ready until he's an adult. How do you know that what they're making in those labs won't kill him? Irina said. Do we really want to trust these underground devils with our son? How much do we really know about the engineers anyway? They could have let us all burn on this surface, Nikolai said. But they didn't. I think we should trust them. I want to go, said Alexei. I should. Some of my friends have already enlisted. Both of his parents were stunned, but it made sense to Alexei. He wanted the war to be over, and he wanted to leave the underground city. But most importantly, he wanted to know if anyone was still alive on the surface. If there was even a sliver of chance that it could be habitable again, he wanted to find out. After much discussion, Irina and Nikolai agreed. It was what was best for the future of Russia, and ultimately, the future of the human race. Alexei's parents delivered him to the Office of Army Recruitment, and he was taken by a man named Commander Volkov to a specialized research facility. This was when Alexei met an engineer for the first time. The engineer was tall and hairy, like a bear walking on its back legs, but with face and hands more like a human's. He was overseeing a group of humans and other engineers as they tinkered with machines that Alexei couldn't even begin to guess the purpose of. Do not be frightened, Alexei, Commander Volkov said. They're going to explain the procedure to you before you have to agree to anything. The engineer looked the boy over, then held up a jar containing something that looked like an insect's exoskeleton. It was green, the same shade as the USSR's army uniforms. This is our new bioorganic armor prototype, the engineer said. We can only graph it onto you while you are still growing. It must grow with you, starting on your back, then moving to your limbs, then your head. Alexei was frightened by the idea, but didn't want to seem weak. He wanted to make sure his father would be proud of him. He was taken into surgery, where the team of engineers and human doctors grafted the plate of bioorganic armor onto his spine. Once the surgery was over, he was wheeled into a recovery room, where he was fed a simple meal alongside all of his friends and classmates. They had all gone through the same procedure. Over the next eight years, Alexei and his comrades went through the painful process of growing their exoskeleton. Like the engineer had said, it grew with them. But the growth happened in painful spurts rather than gradually. The worst thing about the armor was that it couldn't be removed. 
but it gave them many advantages to normal soldiers as well. Once it covered Alexei's legs, he found he could jump higher and run farther than any human normally could. When it grew over his arms, it gave him increased strength. By the time he was 18, it had covered his head, giving it a fly-like appearance, but also granting him stereoscopic vision and the ability to hear radio transmissions without the need for any other communication device. During this time, he and the other boys were trained by Commander Volkov, learning how to use the powers granted to them by their exoskeletons for combat. When they were deemed ready, they were all outfitted with shoulder cannons, supply packs, and guns, all of which were also bioorganic and were surgically attached. It had been eight long years since the end of the world, and Alexei was now able to set foot back on the surface. The world he returned to was almost unrecognizable. There were no signs of life outside of weeds and vines overtaking the irradiated ruins of buildings. Within the first hour of returning to the surface, Alexei gave up any hope of finding survivors. He heard Volkov's voice barking orders through the suit. There was no time to reminisce about the past. The soldiers had a job to do. In the long history of the world, the planet has played host to a wide variety of ancient civilizations. There are far, far too many of those for any one video to cover. People make it their careers to discover and catalog the civilizations that preceded us in the modern era. Archaeologists and historians make it their life's work to learn everything there is to know about these mighty empires and kingdoms that span vast swaths of land where there are now dozens of countries. A lot of these civilizations are famous, even school children know about them. Take a look at the Roman Empire, for example. Everyone knows about the mighty Roman Empire. Julius Caesar took control of the Roman Republic and created the empire that would go on to be one of the largest empires in history at the time. It controlled practically everything in Europe and North Africa, and even parts of Asia. The Romans made amazing advancements in culture, architecture, law, and practically everything else. In fact, their legacy can even be seen in pop culture today. The American Senate is modeled off the Roman Senate, and practically every nation in the world has their own kind of wine, a Roman invention. Or take the Macedonian Empire. A lot of people don't know its name, but you almost definitely know the person who created it. Alexander the Great. At only 20, he took his father's throne. Then he began launching military expeditions, and it soon became clear that young Alexander was a brilliant tactician. Never defeated in battle, he managed to extend his vast empire across all of West Asia and North Africa, stretching all the way to Egypt and India. Like Caesar would go on to do after him, he managed to create one of the largest empires in history except he did it all before he even turned 30. Though he died young and his empire was split apart by his generals, he brought Greek thought, culture, and philosophy, not to mention science, to the far reaches of Inner Asia. And of course, there is the Mongol Empire, led by the fearsome Genghis Khan. The Mongols, a nomadic people from Central Asia, were divided into dozens of distinct tribes until Genghis Khan united them under one flag. And from there, they spread outward violently into the rest of Asia, conquering China, Korea, Eastern Europe, and practically all of Asia. In doing so, they created the largest empire in history and killed somewhere near 40 million people in their conquests, 10% of the world's population at the time. But they also created a safe trade route from China to Europe, what is now known as the Silk Road, and their innovations with cavalry would go on to inform warfare using horses for the next 800 years. Moving out of Asia, there are also the legendary Mayans. The Mayans were more of a loose confederation of different tribes, working together to advance a common civilization. They didn't conquer as much land as the others, only one area in Central America, but they crafted a complex society with laws, civic duties, social rules, and extremely advanced religious rites and architecture. If you go to South America today, you can still see the remnants of their empire. Step pyramids that look sort of like ziggurats, deep in the South American jungle interior. They invented astronomy, calendars, writing, and many forms of art like mosaics, all without contact with European society. Needless to say, the advancements empires have made throughout history are so important, we use them in our daily lives all the time. And we know a lot about these ancient empires too. How could we not? They've made massive impacts on the planet and population, not to mention religion, culture, law, society as a whole. 
But what if there was an empire on the planet that was larger and more advanced than all of the ones we just looked through? And not just more advanced by a little bit. So advanced that they were creating nuclear reactors well before Alexander was taking his first steps, or Plutarch was trying to complete a history of the Greeks. So advanced that we still don't totally understand what they were capable of. I'd certainly call that anomalous, wouldn't you? And that's not all. What if this empire also managed to stay hidden from modern science for centuries? They didn't stay alive, but their ruins have never been found by the scientific community. Their relics have been squirreled away from the eyes of the world over the decades. You'd never find a reference to the Mechanite Empire in a history textbook or in a museum. And that's for a very good reason. The SCP Foundation has spent an extremely large amount of time and money ensuring that the evidence of this ancient empire never comes out to the rest of the world. But even if a culture creates anomalies, is the culture itself anomalous? Does it need to be contained? Especially if they're all long dead and their technology has degraded into unusability. Well, maybe. Except their technology is doing just fine. 2,000 years and counting, their technology is still working perfectly. In some cases, better than our modern devices. How can that be possible? How can that not be anomalous? Well, as unbelievable as it might seem, it's true. We'll dive more into what exactly this empire out of Greece was in a bit, but for now we're going to look at an SCP file associated with them. Except this one couldn't be picked up, stuffed in a box and shipped off to a containment locker in Site-19. You'll see why in a minute. But for now, let's just take a look at the file. SCP-2406 lacks any images or flashy documentation, so no clues there. Unless it's not possible to photograph the anomaly for some reason. Hmm. The object class is safe, and the containment procedures aren't very long. A site, Provisional Site-31, has been constructed around SCP-2406 and is under the cover of a Kazakhstani military base. Provisional sites are temporary sites that the Foundation puts up in the field to contain an anomaly that can easily be transported somewhere else for containment. And if it's a Kazakhstani military facility, the anomaly is probably somewhere in Kazakhstan and can't be moved. Hmm, seems reasonable enough. All personnel who work directly with SCP-2406 are required to wear a Type A hazmat suit when in contact with the anomaly and to undergo a full decontamination bath upon exiting. Whatever SCP-2406 is, being in direct contact with it can be dangerous to humans. So the Foundation uses specialized hazardous material suits, the big yellow jumpsuits you see near radiation or chemical spill sites. On top of that, an armed contingent of guards are to remain in place in and around Provisional Site-31 to ensure no one unauthorized accesses the anomaly. Though you'd have to wonder why anyone would try to access a military base. The containment procedures close out by declaring that anyone wanting to directly interact with SCP-2406-1, whatever it is, needs to get authorization from their site director. So, SCP-2406 has at least one sub-anomaly to deal with. Obviously, the Foundation is very interested in keeping this anomaly, or these anomalies, secret and protected at all costs as well as limiting human exposure to something potentially dangerous. Now, let's take a look at the description. SCP-2406 is a mechanical automaton that's 93 meters tall and weighs approximately 210 metric tons. For the Americans among us, that's about 300 feet in height and 230 tons, over 450,000 pounds. No wonder the Foundation couldn't move it. After investigating, research concluded that SCP-2406 wasn't sentient, so it wasn't a robot or cyborg or artificial intelligence. An automaton is a machine to perform a specific task, and this thing, whatever it is, was controlled by at least six different operators, if not more. They piloted the machine using 160 different valves and levers within the torso, head, and chest of the automaton. And if it has a head and chest, it has limbs limbs that were controlled by a combination of pneumatics, hydraulics, and clockwork machinery. But controlling is one thing. How the heck does something like this get the power to move? The answer is a nuclear reactor embedded in its torso, with power cables running to its arms and legs. Yep, unbelievable as it may seem, this ancient curiosity was powered by the same source our modern aircraft carriers and nuclear submarines use. SCP-2406 was discovered on August 7, 1985, in the Arlcum Desert, 
but not by the foundation. The Aralkum Desert used to be part of the Aral Sea before the Soviets drained part of it. It was during one of these drainings that the Russian military discovered SCP-2406 by tracking the radiation coming from it. As soon as they realized what they found wasn't some sort of abandoned warhead or uranium deposit, they called in the GRU's P Division, the unit of the Soviet government who dealt with anomalies, in the same way the Foundation did. They kept custody of the anomaly, but only for a few years. When the USSR collapsed in 1991, the Foundation stepped in with their agents and took control of the anomaly while everyone else in the area was busy dealing with the political fallout. They immediately began performing research and learned that the material SCP-2406 is made of isn't just one metal, but a toughened alloy of copper, zinc, nickel, lead, and iron. The mixture is why the metal looks bronze, despite not having any bronze in it. They also found two markings on it. One was on the outside of its back and showed the Aegean numeral for nine. Does that mean there are at least eight more of these things buried somewhere? Maybe. But the Foundation hasn't found any of them. What's more interesting is that the numeral is Aegean, Greek. Despite SCP-2406 lying in a lake in the Aral Sea, pretty far from Greece, the front of the anomaly, its chest, has an intricate symbol of a hammer striking an anvil on it. The right arm of the anomaly has a nozzle with piping attached to it. The piping leads to a pressurized chamber within SCP-2406 that is empty. But the Foundation did manage to find trace residue of various chemicals, such as pine resin, naphtha, quicklime, calcium phosphide, and sulfur inside the corners of the tank. Not coincidentally, those are the exact same chemicals used to create Greek fire, a primitive chemical weapon similar to napalm that the ancient Greeks used in warfare. Between this and the Aegean numeral, the Foundation judged that SCP-2406 was almost definitely constructed in Greece and brought here for some reason. The left arm of the anomaly isn't attached to it. In fact, initial reports said it was torn off at the shoulder and couldn't be found with the rest of it. But it seems that the Foundation managed to recover it since, detailed in one of the addenda in the file. Chemicals weren't the only thing they found inside SCP-2406. When they busted the main access plate open, researchers found something decidedly more morbid. Six different human skeletons located inside its torso area were removed and cataloged before being carbon dated to 1100 BC, over 3,000 years old and they were all wearing an extremely strange set of armor. While it looked Greek, it was made of a strange lead-copper alloy and filled with asbestos lining. Presumably, the armor was designed to absorb the radiation put out by SCP-2406's reactor. There were also tubes from the helmets leading to the outside, so they could breathe safe air. One of the levers pumped water into the tubes so that the pilots didn't die of thirst, and another tube was near the groin probably so they could pee. Seems like the designers ensuring that whoever was piloting SCP-2406 could do so for hours or days. The Foundation ensured through testing that SCP-2406 doesn't work. The limbs don't move, and many of the levers have rusted or broken. All of that damage from disuse is repairable, but there is even more extensive damage from combat. The limbs and head were first discovered run through by long, sharp spikes made of an unknown substance. Though it feels like chitin, its molecular structure is closer to coral, and on top of that, it's biological and contains some elements of human DNA. Parts of its limbs are also crushed or indented with a segmented pattern, like a boa constrictor wrapping around its prey. The evidence suggests that SCP-2406 was in an intense fight with some sort of giant monster and lost. But that's all in the past. SCP-2406 also has a more present problem, its reactor. It melted through the back of the anomaly, penetrating the Earth and seems to still be burning incredibly hot and radioactive nearly a kilometer under the surface. Engineers think that when it was intact, it works similarly to natural nuclear reactions rather than modern reactors, like when a uranium deposit begins to undergo fission. If nothing else, it means that SCP-2406's designers were studying those and were far more advanced scientifically than any other culture on the face of the planet at the time that we know of. While they were investigating the wreck, Foundation personnel also discovered something interesting, a watertight ceramic jar like the ones ancient Egyptians used to preserve organs. When they broke the seal, they found two tightly bound scrolls written in a unique language resembling Mycenaean Greek. It took 10 years of research for the Foundation's best linguists to translate the scrolls. What they found confirmed their theory. 
The scrolls were religious and written by a group called the Followers of Mekane, the ancient precursors to what we now call the infamous Church of the Broken God, an anomalous cult that seeks to rebuild their deity and make themselves more than human. The foundations had run-ins with them in the past, but the documents indicate that 3,000 years ago, they weren't just a cult, they were an empire. The first scroll was translated to the following. The Colossi were constructed in her schema. The Colossi were constructed to defend, secure, contain. The enemy, Grand Carcist Ion, betrayer of man, destroyer of progress, sorcerer king of Aditum, a desolate domain of failed and fallen creation, built with the body's flesh of dead gods. Upon a throne of black ambition the enemy plots. The enemy is not a priest. They are a merchant, and they have sold the whole world totality. The Colossi were constructed in her schema. The Colossi were constructed to defend, secure, contain. The profane tools must be broken, uncreated. Drink deep the silver blood of Mekane. May her sacrifice not be in vain. Strange, but definitely religious. It seems to be a dedication to the broken god Mekane. The Colossi were created to fight their ancient enemy, the Sarkists. But the second document is much more interesting. This is a testament of Matriarch Euprexia, Legate's faithful, servant of Mekane. I am not a warrior, but all warriors are dead, breaking themselves upon the enemy's host. The enemy has set their plan into motion. The Sorcerer King surrounds himself with corpses. To fight is to grow his legions. Egypt retreats from the world. The Hedites have fallen into chaos. The conspirators of Crete have sacrificed their own. The Aegean have fallen into barbarism. The city of a thousand pillars is forever lost, has always been lost. Even the Deva grow desperate, with the enemy at their border. The center collapses, kingdoms crumble, the damage is done. The light of reason flickers and wanes. But Mekane sacrificed herself so that we might be free. We refuse to return to that darkness. We would rather die. But the siege at Euros was won. We must strike while the metal is hot, and thus we march for Kythera at the end of all things. We have crossed the wine-dark sea. We have seen villages ravaged by the Red Death. We have seen the dead, the dying, and the deathless. We cast the accursed to holy flame. We enter his desolate domain, and in our left hand we carry our answer. We cannot undo what has been done, but we can delay the Sarkic dawn. So it seems that the ancient Mechanite Empire were once at war with another empire, the hated Sarkists. Losing and all their allies dying, they poured their resources into these massive mechs and sent them deep into enemy territory, equipped with some sort of doomsday weapon as a hope for success. What happens next is, unfortunately, a mystery. On December 12th of 1998, the Foundation found something almost 30 kilometers away from SCP-2406 during a routine patrol. At first, the researchers were confused. Had they found another wreck? One of the other eight mentioned? Or perhaps the body of the mysterious creature SCP-2406 had fallen in battle with? But after excavating it, they realized they had found something they hadn't even been looking for to begin with. SCP-2406's left arm. The way it landed suggested that it had been torn off during the battle and hurled away. But what monster could possibly throw something that heavy 30 entire kilometers? Either way, what the Foundation found attached to SCP-2406's arm is much more interesting. The researchers aren't sure what it is, but it's much different from the rest of SCP-2406. It seems to be some kind of weapon, but one that's not made of any metals on Earth, and with an incredibly anomalous design. The Foundation personnel, not sure of what to make of it, designated it SCP-2406-1. Its purpose is similarly unknown, and the consensus seems to be that whatever it is, it far exceeds human understanding. But what the Foundation is sure of is that it seems to bend reality near it, though they're not sure how because it doesn't seem to affect anything. The Foundation's best minds are stumped by it. All they can say for certain is that if it was ever repaired, powered up, and activated, it could do unprecedented damage to local reality. So interaction with it was highly regulated, and the Foundation put it away with the rest of SCP-2406. 
History is often the greatest teacher. By looking at the past, we can learn from it with the benefit of hindsight. Such as in the early 20th century, when the entire planet was in the grip of a horrifying war. At the time, this conflict was often referred to as the Great War, although there was little great about it. Others knew it as the war to end all wars, the largest armed engagement the world had known, although it would not be the last. Today, with that hindsight we just mentioned, we know it as World War I. In June 1914, an Archduke of Austria was shot dead by a Serbian assassin, and as a result of the complicated treaties forged between various nations, soon much of the world was involved in the war that started out as little more than a scuffle between neighbors. The horrors of trench warfare, the carnage caused by the earliest chemical weapons and armored tanks, left a permanent and lasting scar on the world's history one still mourned and remembered to this day. The advances in chemical and mechanized warfare that took place during World War I range from the use of chemicals like tear gas used to disable targets, to more lethal compounds like mustard gas. And of course, this was the first war to introduce tanks to the battlefield. Although these were clumsy and cumbersome to begin with, it was arguably the advent of the First World War that forced many advancements in armored warfare. It was the belief of many individuals on all sides that if the Great War was made too gruesome and horrific to continue, it would come to its natural end. This, of course, did not happen, only encouraging each participant of World War I to continue advancing their weaponry. But what if there were weapons developed during World War I that were too dangerous to be deployed? With every side looking for advantage over their adversaries, what if some turned to the unethical? even the anomalous, to gain the upper hand in the war. Introducing SCP-186, otherwise known as To End All Wars. Try to imagine weaponry that was so incredibly advanced for the mid-1910s, yet so horribly and unjustifiably cruel. Worse than gas that can cause blisters to form not only on the skin, but also inside the lungs. More advanced than armored vehicles with mounted machine guns crawling across no man's land. It's hard to picture something that could be more devastating than that, especially for the time period. But a good measure of a weapon's destructive power is usually found in the damage it leaves in its wake. In this case, SCP-186 is exactly that. Not the anomalous weapons themselves. But the site of a battle that took place between the 24th of July and the 13th of August in 1917. The event became known as the Battle of Husiatin Woods, but you won't find any mention of it in the history books. Any and all records of the battle have been secretly expunged by the SCP Foundation, and their own archive is now the only place where someone can find the details of what happened over those few weeks. The engagement took place between the German Imperial Army and forces belonging to Russia's provisional government, a small skirmish in comparison to the enormity of many battles of the First World War. So what happened at the Battle of Husiatin Woods to make it so horrible that it had to be stricken from the historical record? For that, we have to go back to Husiatin, a small settlement in western Ukraine. In July of 1917, the surviving remnants of a Russian division had been scattered. The Germans' counterattack against the Kurnensky offensive had driven the Russian troops to the dense forest that surrounded the town of Husiatin. You might be forgiven for thinking that the outnumbered Russian force was decimated by almost 500 German soldiers pursuing them, but you would be very, very wrong. As the opposing forces met, they engaged each other in a fearsome battle. But this was unlike any encounter that had taken place over the course of World War I, or ever would again. Both sides were armed with anomalous weaponry, possessing technology beyond any that had ever been seen at the time. To this day, the SCP Foundation has been baffled by these weapons. Even with their unique understanding of the anomalous, Foundation researchers had been unable to replicate any of them, and instead keeps them secured in the munitions wing of Site-23, all under the designation of SCP-186-1. Among the recovered instances of SCP-186-1 is a highly modified Skoda M1909 machine gun. However, rather than behaving like a standard firearm, 
This gun would cause rapid forming growths, not unlike tumors to appear within the body of its targets. Another was concertina wire, a form of spiraled razor wire commonly used in trenches. Only this wire was coated in an unknown compound that caused permanent hallucination whenever the wire cut a person and allowed the hallucinogen to enter their bloodstream. A number of rifle cartridges were also found littered around SCP-186. Sounds pretty normal for a First World War battlefield, right? Except these cartridges were not filled with gunpowder like you would expect them to be. Instead, they inexplicably contained human bone, ground into powder. The purpose of this ammunition or how it was manufactured is still unknown to the SCP Foundation. As if a gun that causes tumors and hallucination triggering wire weren't bad enough, Foundation researchers also found a number of grenades used by the troops at the site of SCP-186. These were British Empire Standard Issue No. 27 grenades, but they contained a unique, anomalous gas that was capable of passing through any and all filters. Gas masks were developed during World War I to protect soldiers from mustard and tear gas on the battlefield, but these masks only offered basic filtration by today's standards. Even so, the gas contained in these grenades was strong enough to negate any and all filtration systems, but that was far from its worst quality. Did this unknown gas choke troops? Not quite. Did it disable them like tear gas? In a way, yes. But this gas did so by making any soldier exposed to it experience the sensation of having their body set on fire. Constantly. Also recovered at SCP-186 were the remains of some form of explosive, and it is believed by the Foundation that it was detonated at the culmination of the Battle of Hewson Woods, causing approximately a third of the battle's total casualties. Foundation researchers estimate that almost 300 civilians were either caught in the blast, or died as a result of the crossfire between the German and Russian forces. The soldiers involved were also all permanently incapacitated or killed, or at least, almost all of them. So where did these anomalous weapons come from? And why were they used just in this battle, not throughout the First World War? According to records kept from the public by the SCP Foundation, the German troops in the Houston Woods were accompanied by a Hungarian advisor to their military named Matthias Nemes. Under his orders, they specifically targeted and tracked the Russian division that was retreating from them, who were similarly accompanying a French scientist, Dr. Jean Durand. It was these two men, Nemes and Durand, who were responsible for arming the Germans and Russians with their arsenals of anomalous weapons. They had ensured that their inventions of death had only received limited manufacturing, and had intentionally joined opposing sides of the war effort to test their creations in real combat. In other words, it appears that Durand and Nemes has been working together since the beginning of the war and the troops they were with had been manipulated into taking part in a big test. These soldiers were just as unlucky as the civilians caught in the crossfire. Today, the SCP Foundation has established an automated security perimeter around the site of SCP-186, preventing access to anyone unless authorized. Everything within the perimeter is frequently patrolled and observed by security personnel. Why the need for so much security at an old battleground? Given the damage caused by the use of so many anomalous weapons, including those that the Foundation was unable to recover, the area of SCP-186 has become a hotspot for unusual happenings, even long after the Battle of Houston Woods ended. These anomalies include abnormal environmental or weather conditions. For example, all the trees in the southwestern portion of the former battlefield died and decomposed at an accelerated rate in 1923, while the temperature dropped to a permanent minus 15 degrees Celsius four years later. But yet, there was never any snowfall. Then there were the sounds of gunfire in 1932, despite there being nobody inside the SCP-186 site. A number of years later, a pair of Foundation agents disappeared on a routine patrol of the area and were never seen again. Of course, 23 years after the end of the war to end all wars, the world was plunged into chaos and found itself at war once again. During this time, SCP Foundation personnel were instructed to evacuate the site of SCP-186, based on intelligence from their allied operatives who were working undercover inside the Third Reich. 
As the Foundation disembarked their observation posts, a faint glow was visible coming from SCP-186. Four years passed, and the Second World War came to a close. The Foundation returned to re-establish their containment of SCP-186, and immediately discovered 13 corpses dressed in German Army uniforms, bearing the insignia of the 4th Panzer Army. There were a further 27 bodies of soldiers wearing the garb of the Soviet 22nd Army. Both sets of bodies had already begun decaying, although someone had removed the dog tags and anything else that could identify these dead troops. It seems that history had, to some extent, repeated itself, as the Nazi and Soviet forces had clashed on the same battlefield where their German and Russian predecessors had fought during the Battle of Houston Woods. Years later, in 1959, a large sinkhole formed in the northeast portion of SCP-186. Four men were found wandering nearby, all extremely disoriented, wearing decomposing military uniforms. Were they lost survivors of the Nazi-Soviet battle? No. These men were in World War I uniforms, German Empire and Russian Standard Issue. They had survived the Battle of Houston Woods and were somehow still standing even though they should have died during the First World War. How did these troops manage this? Well, the final anomalous weapon recovered at the site of SCP-186 were mortar shells, but unsurprisingly, these weren't your standard high-explosive artillery. Much like those grenades mentioned earlier, these mortar shells contained a unique, previously unseen gas. But instead of causing the perpetual pain of being on fire, this gas altered the biology of animal cells that it came into contact with. Somehow, it triggered a change that prevented a body's cells from ceasing life function, keeping them continuously operational. In other words, it meant that any soldiers exposed to this gas simply could not die. That's right, some of the troops involved in the Battle of Houston Woods are still alive to this day. The SCP Foundation immediately began excavating the sinkhole and discovered 23 bodies buried beneath in a mass grave. There were more of the surviving World War I soldiers, kept alive for decades by the mortar gas. Some of them still had infected wounds and battlefield injuries that should have killed them, yet their bodies refused to die. The soldiers were rounded up and hauled off to Site-23, where the Foundation researchers began assessing them. However, they were unable to glean any useful information from the German and Russian troops that had been unearthed. All of the soldiers exhibited symptoms of extensive psychological trauma and had developed various mental disorders while buried alive under the battlefield. They had all been driven to insanity, perhaps as a result of their unnaturally extended lifespans, maybe from being buried underground and unable to die for so long. Or perhaps it was the wartime atrocities they witnessed that drove the soldiers over the brink. History is a great teacher, but those willing to forget its mistakes are often doomed to repeat them. Mathias Nemes and Dr. Jean Durand created the anomalous weapons responsible for SCP-186, and similar minds would later go on to build the atomic bomb and countless weapons of mass destruction after. World wars, the suffering of countless troops and civilians, these parts of history mean nothing if we don't allow ourselves to learn from them. And maybe that's our curse as a species, that we are doomed to fight the war to end all wars again and again and again. Some say that SCP-2102 was a mistake, an abomination created by an accident of medical science. Maybe those people are right. Maybe there's much more to it than that. Either way, they don't know the full story. How could they? They weren't there. They weren't there all the way back in 1972. But Dr. Pavel Zukal was. The earliest moments, the events that directly preceded SCP-2102's creation began on March 2nd. The wind was carrying an unforgiving, freezing bite with it. As Zukal made his way to the Institute of Experimental Medicine, Zisav, in Czechoslovakia. With the Cold War between the USSR and the United States underway, 
there was already an air of secrecy on both sides. Espionage and intelligence gathering operations were rampant, bringing with them paranoia and distrust. There was no way of knowing if someone was a double agent, leaking information to the West. But while the governments of Russia, America, and their various respective allies and enemies scrambled for control and amassed obscene quantities of nuclear arms in secret, there were even more cogs turning, hidden in the deepest, darkest shadows. The SCP Foundation's long-standing rivalry with various other groups of interest was well known among any with a high enough security clearance. Most of these groups were radicals or outliers, despite possessing knowledge of anomalies or even being directly linked to them. A lot of GOIs were independent of any world government, but for decades, the Foundation had been aware of a directly competing establishment, effectively a parallel of their own organization on the other side of the globe. They were known as GRU Division P, a USSR equivalent of the SCP Foundation themselves. It is unclear based on what was recovered from Dr. Zukal's personal diary if he had been directly scouted by GRU Division P for their project in Czechoslovakia. Given the air of secrecy engulfing the USSR at the time, it is possible that Pavel himself had no inclination that Division P was even involved in the project due to take place at the Institute of Experimental Medicine. He might have suspected, but with no way of knowing for sure. Similarly, there was no way Zukal could have known where the project would lead, what he would have a hand in creating. The initial few weeks after his arrival at the Institute were rocky, to say the least. Zukal, along with a team of scientists and technicians working on orders direct from Moscow, had to contend with unreliable equipment and difficulty getting electricity to power the project. Eventually, after clearing those initial hurdles, testing could begin. But what was the goal of this mysterious project? Well, through Zakal, GRU Division P and the Kremlin were chasing something the scientific world has been trying to accomplish for decades. Something that could change the very landscape of not only the Cold War, but the entirety of modern medicine, the secrets of cellular regeneration. Unlocking that would, in theory, enable them to create the world's very first unkillable super soldier. And hey, it definitely wouldn't be the craziest secret operation carried out by a world superpower during the Cold War. The CIA spent millions turning a cat into a listening device and training it to infiltrate enemy headquarters. This so-called acoustic kitty was struck and killed by a random van during its first mission. Compared to that, a cell-regenerating super-soldier was positively sensible. With a worldwide nuclear arms race already underway, perhaps the project's ultimate goal was to produce an entire army of these self-regenerating troops. With something like that in their hands, the USSR would have the manpower to reinforce their nuclear arsenal, and potentially even soldiers capable of surviving and healing from the effects of an atomic blast. On the 5th of May, 1972, the first of the project's human test subjects began to show promising results. They underwent physical trauma at the hands of Zukal and the other scientists, only for their bodies to react much faster than the ordinary healing process would allow. Rapid clotting took place in the affected areas, preventing the subjects from bleeding out. However, this quickly went awry. The clots turned into severe lesions. Realizing this had occurred thanks to Mikali, one of the other project scientists administering too much neodymium, Zukal chastised his colleague, vowing him to drag him to Moscow personally if another mistake like that ever took place again. Unfortunately, by the last few days of June, Dr. Zukal and his team were no closer to success. Every subject that underwent testing succumbed to the same necrosis. Reducing the amount of neodymium had only made the reaction worse, something Pavel couldn't allow Mikali to know without the risk of it being held over his head for the remainder of the project. In every instance, the doctors were able to trigger rapid cell division, 50 times faster than that which occurs in the ordinary healing process of human beings. But the biggest drawback was that this division would quickly become uncontrollable. It was creating enough new matter on a cellular level that it would choke each test subject in its own excess waste. As you might expect, Dr. Zukal noted this in his diary that this process wasn't a pretty sight. Come mid-August 1972, the project scientists decided they needed a test subject with more resilience than the average person, and a suitable candidate was provided. 
He was a counter-revolutionary who had been sentenced to 15 years in a uranium mine as a punishment detail. Despite such an extended period of time under the harsh conditions of the mine and the close proximity to a radioactive element such as uranium, the man managed to survive unscathed. Upon closer examination, this new guinea pig, referred to as X-16, had a rate of healing twice as fast as that of an average man. Perhaps it was a random genetic abnormality that made X-16 this way, or maybe it was a result of his extensive time in the uranium mines. Either way, it made him the perfect new subject for Zucal's experiments. Initially, Subject X-16's preliminary testing results looked promising. The wound healing process was actually taking place now, instead of resulting in necrosis or aborting it as it had with the earlier experiments. In fact, Dr. Zucal seemed to think X-16 was healing almost too quickly. But nevertheless, testing continued, although not without a different type of problem. The questionable morality of what they were doing began to set in for Pavel, causing him nights of endless tossing and turning, unable to sleep as he reflected on what he'd done. X-16 had managed to survive for much longer than the earlier test subjects, but it was clear that the torture this man had to endure was exacting a heavy toll. Every day, the doctors would lacerate him, time and time again, recording the results. And every day, he survived, only for the cycle to begin again the next day. For his own part, Zukal was conflicted. On the one hand, the results of the testing were proving successful, lasting far longer and working far more effectively than they had in the past, and yet on the other, it came at the cost of one man's continued suffering. To make matters worse, Laval had no way of voicing his concerns to any of his team. Any questioning of his orders or the project's methods would have been viewed by GRU Division P and the KGB as sedition and treason earning the good doctor a one-way ticket to a gulag, or, if he was lucky, a clean shot to the back of the head from an agent's pistol. Often morality is sacrificed for the greater good, in the pursuit of the advancement of science or a nation's goals. But now that the project was showing results with X-16, now that it was real, what they were doing still weighed heavily on Dr. Zukal's conscience. Then, on October 15, 1972, the final piece of the puzzle seemed to become clear. By introducing the correct amount of stabilizing agent into the serum they had concocted, Zukal and his team had perfected the composition. Upon administering this newly completed version of the solution, the doctor noted in his diary that Subject X-16 was responding well. At least, medically, the subject was responding well. It was clear that the continuous experimentation he had been subjected to was causing uncooperative behavior in X-16. But so close to the cusp of achieving the project's goals, Dr. Zukal was quick to cast aside his previous doubts about the ethics of their methods. They were so close to victory, so close to the project being over, that it no longer mattered how cooperative X-16 was being. But two weeks and four days later, just as the project was nearing its end goal, disaster struck. MU Dr. Elena Orakova was one of the scientists on Zukal's team, who had primarily helped when examining the early cell divisions, those that were leading to necrosis and causing test subjects to produce too much excessive genetic material. Elena had made a startling discovery and immediately brought it to Dr. Zukal in a distraught show of panic. The cell samples they had used to test their serum were now gaining mass, seemingly from nowhere. Just like the earlier experiments, the effects were working almost too well, causing an overabundance of cellular regeneration to the point where the cells couldn't stop producing masses of waste genetic material. When Zukal brought Elena's findings to doctors Sislard and one Jurji T. Fedinko, the project heads assigned by Division P, they were quick to disregard it as an error determining to press on with the project to meet their deadline. Over the course of the following weeks, up to late November, Zukal was trying to determine what was causing this change. It was clear that unless he and Elena could resolve the issues with the serum, Subject X-16 would be a total failure. But time was running out, with their superiors at GRU Division P and the Kremlin expecting results by early December. Under untold amounts of pressure and subsequent stress, Dr. Pavel Zukal found himself losing time, unable to sleep to the point where he was drifting off whenever he was on the verge of a breakthrough. By the end, Elena was the only member of the team trying to help him methodically figure out what had gone wrong. 
The deadline for the project arrived on December 2nd, 1972. Pavel didn't sleep all night leading up to it, knowing he would have to present a functioning super soldier to GRU Division P. In the best case, he was risking being accused of negligent failure, forced to restart the project from scratch, making his months of hard work redundant. But worst case scenario, Zukal could be charged with treason for having not completed the task he was selected for. On the 2nd of December, he wrote, I really don't know which is better. Eh, tomorrow is a day too. Nobody knows if Dr. Pavel Zukal lived to see that tomorrow. His final diary entry was made on the day SCP-2102 was born. For months, the SCP Foundation had operatives embedded within the Czechoslovakian government as part of innumerable Cold War espionage gathering efforts. During that time, their agents had gathered enough intelligence to make the Foundation aware of a GRU Division P project based at the Institute of Experimental Medicine, and that the scientists there were looking to unlock the secret of rapid cellular regeneration. Someone, possibly even one of Zukal's team, had managed to infiltrate the project and had leaked documents to the SCP Foundation, explaining what was going on in Czechoslovakia. The plan was that the Foundation would move in, in secret of course, to extract and contain Test Subject X-16 in January of 1973. That day would never come to fruition, though. On the 2nd of December, only a month before they had planned to act, the Foundation became aware of a catastrophe occurring at the Institute of Experimental Medicine. One of their agents in Czechoslovakia alerted them to a disturbance that had caused civilians and scientists alike to run from the Institute in fear for their lives. Something had gotten loose, and the Foundation had to act fast. Luckily, a reconnaissance team was stationed in Eastern Europe, Members of various mobile task forces who had been spying on GRU Division P and the rest of the USSR. Moving quickly, the recon team was deployed to Czechoslovakia. Led by a field commander named Merrick, they were given the objective to determine the cause of the situation and, if possible, recover its anomalous source. Merrick and the recon team arrived on site at the Institute's grounds. The entrance to the bunker which had been housing the project was left wide open, with not a soul in sight. As the team progressed further, Merrick couldn't help but notice a pungent smell permeating the labs and offices that they passed. Foundation Command urged their operatives to proceed cautiously and recover any paperwork they could. Among the logistical documents was a diary, belonging to one of the scientists, although the name Pavel Zukal on the cover was no longer legible, forever lost. The further he and the other MTF agents progressed, the worse the smell got. They located an elevator, deciding to take it down to the lower levels of the bunker. One by one, the team filed in, Merrick radioing command. Command, any seismic activity in the area? He asked. Uh, not that we know of, Merrick, came the Foundation's reply. Why? I, uh, I think I just felt something move down there. The elevator had barely descended a foot before it hit something, stopping in an instant. As Merrick tried once again to contact Foundation Command, that same something came tearing through the elevator floor. Over the radio, the SCP Foundation were treated to a cacophony of screeching, tearing metal, along with the screams of their own men. What Merrick and his team had encountered may have once been a man, perhaps someone subjected to cruelty and torture, but now all they saw was an amorphous, fleshy mass. Immediately, the recon team opened fire, engaging what they assumed was a raging monster. It probably never occurred to them that they might have just wanted to be free after years of imprisonment, followed by months of horrendous experiments. Minutes later, Merrick was able to get in contact with Command again, locked in a heated battle with the entity. But every round fired, every shot their guns landed, nothing was having any effect. Whenever Merrick dealt damage to the creature, part of it seemed to grow faster and faster each time. Their guns were useless, unable to stop the expanding monstrous test subject. Even grenades thrown by the MTF operatives, causing multiple explosions, did little to stop the entity in its tracks. Listening in over the radio, knowing they had few options left, the SCP Foundation dispatched a pair of F-4 Phantoms, long-range supersonic fighter jets, equipped with a payload of M47A1 Napalm incendiary bombs. With Merrick and his men almost on the ropes, command issued an order to retreat. They fled the bunker, only to feel the ground shake beneath their feet. The monster had breached the topsoil, still coming after them. Jones, one of the Foundation's agents, was pulled under the encroaching shapeless mass, crushed to death as it continued its pursuit. Utterly horrified at the sight and speed of the creature, 
Merrick started begging command over the radio to get its fighter jets to the scene. Six minutes later, the sound of twin turbine engines shot through the air, followed by the whistle of bombs careening down towards the ground. In a second, Merrick, his team, and the creature were engulfed in a fiery explosion, the heat proving enough to cauterize the fleshy abomination's expanding tissue. Ever since December 1972, the entity now designated as SCP-2102 has been housed at Site-122, contained by the SCP Foundation. They keep it in a modified cell, restrained at all times with its hands and feet in padded sleeves. This is done in order to prevent the risk of injury, either accidental or intentional, given both SCP-2102's anomalous properties and its self-destructive tendencies. Its body is covered in scars, both from its previous escape attempts back when it was known as Subject X-16, and from burns from the F-4 Phantom's napalm payload. These particular injuries seared the entity's ears, mouth, and eyes closed, rendering it deaf, mute, and blind. If SCP-2102 ever suffers any form of external injury, its anomalous properties will trigger. The creature, as you might have guessed, possessed an advanced form of cellular healing, able to regenerate from all wounds inflicted on it. However, the process was never perfected. It still works too well. So well that SCP-2102's cells don't know when to stop. Instead, they continue producing bodily tissue, expanding its mass into every available space without a halt. The process can be slowed if an obstacle is introduced, boxing in the exponentially growing tissue. However, any object or person in its path is eventually crushed under the mounting pressure. At present, the Foundation still has no idea how much SCP-2102's tissue could expand, potentially even posing a risk to the entire world if left unchecked. There is only one surefire way to stop the creature's healing. It can only be halted by cauterizing the open wound with intense heat. It's literally a surefire solution. SCP-2102 is a result of the good Dr. Zukal's work, combined with his and GRU Division P's willingness to put aside their morality. They didn't create an undying, regenerating super-soldier for the USSR as they had intended. Instead, all they accomplished was turning a tortured man into a monster, an abomination endlessly tormented by the experiments performed on him. Not quite as useful on the battlefield, is it? Grigory Gusakov and Anatoly Korniev, both aged 10, tiptoed through the dark, deep woods bordering their quaint Russian village of Obrichenye. The year was 1990, a turbulent time for the people of Russia, seeing as the Soviet Union was on the precipice of collapse. But for these two young boys, global geopolitics was the last thing on their minds. They were too busy hunting for the legendary monstrous witch known only as Baba Yaga. For those in our audience who grew up in Eastern Europe, or those at least decently familiar with Slavic folklore and or the John Wick film series, mention of the name Baba Yaga likely sends a slight chill down your spine. And if it doesn't, just wait. By the end of this video, you'll be afraid to go into the woods alone. Not that going with others would save you, as poor little Grigori and Anatoly were about to find out the hard way. They forged on through those witchy woods. By our standards, the boys were tough and headstrong. After all, the Russian wilderness could be a brutal place to grow up, and in a town like Obrichenye, the old ways of stoicism and perseverance were prized over fear and caution. All except for one particular area, the supernatural. Like many small villages all over the world at every point in history, Obrichenye had its fair share of local superstitions. Chief among them was the belief that the local forest was enchanted, and that when people wandered in among the trees, many of them would never return. They would fall into the gnarled clutches of the carnivorous witch Baba Yaga, and their bones would lay among the roots and dead leaves until they someday crumbled into dust. It was starting to get dark out. When the two boys had first set off, it had been with the intention of proving their mettle among the other local children. They didn't fear Baba Yaga. The old witch in the woods was just another fairy story meant to frighten children, and they weren't children anymore, though they would never live to be men. It wasn't long before they were beyond the point of no return. Which way was out and which way was further in? It hardly mattered anymore, as carry-on birds cawed far above. The bravado that put them here was starting to falter now, but neither dared show it. 
They'd rather be put in mortal peril than show fear in front of one another. Was something moving in the distant shadows? A thin, twisted human figure, impossible to make out save for the faint glow of its eyes in the gathering dark? They couldn't tell what was real, and what was their mind playing cruel tricks on them? A hoarse whisper issued through the brittle trees in the moments that followed. It was an ancient voice. A voice that had echoed in the nightmares of generations. A voice that had seen centuries. It spoke in an older Russian dialect that neither of the young boys could understand. But somehow, the essence of its message still rung clear in their hearts and minds. Welcome, little children. To my forest, here your lives are forfeit. You are my property. I look forward to chewing the tender meat of your young bones. That was all they needed to hear to start running. Gregory and Anatoly turned and fled, screaming for help into the darkness of the forest. Both gasped as they ran through what seemed to be a giant spider web. They spat and spluttered, trying to swat away the silky strands as they ran from the voice. Little did they know, what they'd just run through was no spider web. They tried to press on, but their footsteps slowed. The forest was changing around them, twisting, shifting, sparkling. What had seemed terrifying before was suddenly, oddly, Beautiful. The two boys just stood and watched as the forest turned into a gorgeous technicolor light show, unlike anything they'd ever seen before. Strange figures hopped and danced through the foliage. One tall figure approached them out of the trees, a beautiful fair-haired maiden. The two boys were entranced by her, their hearts filled with pure golden light. Why were they running before? They couldn't even remember. They just smiled as the woman approached them in her long, flowing dress, smiling back. She was like something out of a fairy tale. They didn't react. They didn't even realize what was happening. As the jaws of the horrible, ancient old crone closed around their skulls for the last time, Grigori and Anatoly were never seen again. Just another two children gone missing in the woods the latest entries on a long list of tragedies to hit the village of Ogrichenyi, but they were also the straws that broke the camel's back. The villagers were sick of living in fear under the fabled witch. They would have their revenge. The men of the village gathered up their weapons and formed a hunting party. Guns, torches, knives, axes, and fury. They would slay the beast that had taken so many of their friends and their children in the woods. As soon as their forces were assembled, they charged into the forest, looking for blood. With their numerical advantage and single-minded determination, it didn't take them long to find the monster in the woods. She was every bit as hideous and nightmarish as they had anticipated. A gnarled, snarling crone with long, clawed fingers and dirty fangs. They got her in their sights and prepared to open fire, but none of them were ready for Baba Yaga's counteroffensive. She moved like a leaf in a strong wind, swift and effortless. The men who'd made the mistake of getting too close to her with knives and axes tasted her terrible wrath. She tore through them with claws like iron, sank her fangs into their flesh, lifted and tossed them like rag dolls. How could she be so fast and so strong? The men were terrified. This was no mere woman. It was a true monster squeezed into a barely human form. By the time the creature was finally incapacitated, it'd taken countless bullets and strikes. How any creature could survive such an assault was unimaginable. Several members of the hunting party were dead by this point. Others had been overtaken by a strange form of madness. A couple of them had been given to constant giggling fits or were speaking long strings of nonsense. Others had been rendered entirely catatonic by the experience. It was clear that the witch had powers beyond their understanding. They needed to return it to the village and destroy it as quickly as possible. The monster was bound and dragged back to Obrichenyi. After seeing how it bewitched some of the men, they avoided direct contact whenever possible. They would do everything they could to see justice done. 
Of course, there would be no due process for Baba Yaga. The violence that had erupted in the forest was more than enough proof to justify the beast's immediate death sentence. The local priest gave a prayer, though he remarked that he was sure this monster was the creation and servant of the devil, and the execution commenced. A local used a blessed sword, anointed with holy water, to hack off the Baba Yaga's head. Its body was shot several times for good measure, and it was finally doused in gasoline and set on fire. The remains were buried just outside the village limits, hoping that the Baba Yaga's evil wouldn't continue to haunt their town, even in death. Isolated villages in the Russian steppe aren't famous for their communication with outsiders, especially back in 1990 when the Soviet Union was still clinging on to control and the internet was still in its infancy. It took a few weeks for news of a village capturing a so-called local witch to reach the SCP Foundation. After closely studying the peculiar disappearance records in the area, they sent over a detachment of field agents to investigate, and perhaps conduct a few interviews with the locals. They had no way of knowing there wouldn't be any left by the time they arrived. When the field agents reached Obercheny, it was already a ghost town. Not a single survivor was found, only the evidence of fresh carnage. Desiccated bodies were found in some of the village's houses, in others only body parts. A hole in the ground next to the village seemed to show evidence of some subterranean creature clawing its way back up to the top. Whatever this creature was, it clearly crawled back up from the earth and exacted bloody revenge against those who had buried it. Blood trails from some of the bodies leading back into the woods made it clear where the creature had fled to after massacring the entire village. Given the sudden increase in the situation's severity, Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, aka the Village Idiots, were brought in to apprehend the fugitive witch. But much like the literal Village Idiots that had come before them, this MTF had no idea what they were up against. They entered the forest outside Obrecheni with superior tactics and weaponry to the villagers, with orders to contain the creature at all costs. They didn't exactly know what they were searching for in the dark amongst the trees, but when the first operatives laid eyes on the twisted old crone, they almost reflexively relaxed their guard. For some of the village idiots, this would be the last mistake they ever made. Some of the operatives began to feel funny. Much like Grigori Anatoly and some members of the hunting party, they began to see the forest warping and shifting around them. They giggled at all the funny colors and sighed, feeling an overwhelming sense of calmness and euphoria. It was honestly the best they'd felt in years. Perhaps they were wrong about hunting the witch in here. Maybe the real anomaly here was a Russian forest that made you feel awesome when you stepped inside. While the affected agents were giggling away in their own little la la land, Baba Yaga was bringing the pain. With the same freakish speed, strength, and ferocity that had surprised the hunting party weeks earlier, the witch was tearing through MTF Epsilon 6, ripping through hardened tactical armor with her long claws and teeth. She took shot after shot, enough tranquilizer to put down an elephant, but she kept fighting. In the end, the training and numerical superiority of the task force won out. They were able to secure and contain the Baba Yaga, soon redesignated SCP-352 and take it to a nearby Foundation containment site for further studies. There they officially recorded all the details, from the creature's incredible speed and strength to its regenerative ability so extensive that it could even survive being decapitated and burned. But what about the hallucinogenic effects? Like a hungry spider, the Baba Yaga's true power comes in her ability to spin a deadly web. Her body is able to produce long, thin, hair-like fibers, each one coated in powerful hallucinogenic enzymes that induce a sense of placid, euphoric stillness in its victims. When it isn't engaging multiple targets, the creature can sometimes take multiple days to consume a single, still-living victim, taking them apart and eating them piece by piece. Speaking of eating, as you can probably imagine, in order to keep SCP-352 uneventfully contained, it's ideal to make sure it isn't hangry. In order to keep 352 well-fed, they need to stock up on its favorite food, human flesh. Though, specifically, 352 has a real hankering for babies. While the Foundation are currently exploring anomalous means of keeping the Baba Yaga fed, until those means are fully ironed out, they need to keep this monster fed the old-fashioned way, only ever withdrawing food as punishment if it attempts to breach containment. After all, there's a very good reason why parents and children across the Slavic world fear Baba Yaga. 
She's always hungry, and in the end, she always gets what she wants. You're driving down a long highway, lost in an area you don't know too well, trying to find the right turn that'll have you heading back towards your home. You keep driving, the nighttime quiet all around you. Deciding to try and break that silence, you reach for the radio, turning the dial to filter through all the garbled, distorted voices and songs from nearby local radio stations that are too far out of range to come through clearly. You try your best to listen to the music from one radio station, but eventually the sound of the static only makes you wish for the silence you were trying to break. Your fingers nudge the tuning dial on your car radio once again, and finally, something comes through. It isn't loud or clear, but under the distortion, you can make out the sound, and it isn't a song or even a late news broadcast. The first thing you hear sounds like a short musical tone, only for about 10 seconds. Next, a young girl's voice speaking in a language you don't understand, even through the distorted audio. From her accent, you assume it's Russian, but you still have no idea what the words she's saying mean. With nothing else to listen to, you let the broadcast play. Still driving alone in the dark with nothing but the strange adolescent voice to accompany you, your mind begins to wander. She sounds like she's speaking something, but the rhythm of the words is somehow familiar to you, even though you don't speak Russian. Then it hits you. She's counting, but you don't feel smart for having worked that out. Instead, something about knowing that makes your blood run cold. You carry on driving through the night. After a few short minutes, the Russian girl stops counting, and the musical tone plays again under the distortion, leaving you alone in the car once again, with nothing but your thoughts and questions of what exactly you just heard. Thankfully, we have the answer. What you heard was SCP-3034. Since 1964, this same broadcast has been made a vast number of times, 627 times, in fact. You'd have to be within two kilometers of the broadcast's point of origin to hear it, where Foundation personnel have tried and failed numerous times to triangulate its source. The numbers heard recited in the SCP-3034 broadcast are actually a countdown from 200, read aloud in Russian. All Foundation staff are able to do while stationed at the nearby Provisional Site 3034 is scour radio frequencies for occurrences of SCP-3034. Checking their equipment is properly maintained and calibrated before they are eventually rotated off-site and replaced with a new group of staff. There is only one rule that any Foundation members working at Provisional Site 3034 must follow. They are only permitted to send one radio transmission with their equipment, a single phrase in reply to the SCP-3034 broadcast, Vizio Harashu. Receiving this, the countdown stops and the broadcast ends, but never permanently. SCP-3034 has been known to repeatedly occur, seemingly at random. The shortest recorded gap between broadcasts was two weeks, while the longest so far lasted six whole months. You may have heard the term number station mentioned before, but these are far from just random numerical sequences sent out over the airwaves without purpose. General speculation surrounding number stations points to them being the tools of espionage agents, a way of sending coded, highly sensitive messages or information without the risk of compromising their cover. The use of number station transmissions is often attributed to spies working on foreign soil, who utilize shortwave radio frequencies, speech synthesis, Morse code, and either regular or sporadic timing schedules. While it's true that times have changed and technology has progressed considerably, there appears to be evidence that number stations are still used among various intelligence and espionage agencies today. Despite being considered an old-fashioned method of communication, these low-tech shortwave stations remain a viable, reliable option for the transmission and reception of intelligence to field agents. The CONET project is a comprehensive archive of this phenomenon, and its founder, Aiken Fernandez, has long been fascinated by number stations. According to him, this system is completely secure because the messages can't be tracked. The recipient could be anywhere. You just send spies to the country and get them to buy a radio. They know where to tune and when, 
So what does the distorted broadcast of numbers from SCP-3034 mean? Is it the work of covert agents? And if so, whose side are they on? Most importantly, why does the SCP Foundation make certain there are always three of its personnel on site, ready to send the all is well message whenever SCP-3034 begins broadcasting? SCP-3034 was first discovered by the Foundation in 1964, after a defector from the Soviet GRUP, a division tasked with acquiring and studying anomalies on behalf of the USSR, gave them a tip. Commander Robert Malthus, along with a team of six, including a man named Agent Browning, selected for his knowledge of Russian dialects, were sent to investigate at Provisional Site 3034. Here, the team uncovered partially burned records and logbooks, all kept in Russian, along with evidence that the site had been evacuated shortly before their arrival. Carved into a desk, also in Russian, were two phrases, don't let her finish, and tell her all is well. On the team's second day at the site, an automated alarm sounded at 7.30 a.m., alerting them to the incoming SCP-3034 broadcast. Following the instructions on the desk, Agent Browning was able to stop the broadcast, telling the young Russian girl that all was well. A tape was partially recovered by the team from the site and translated from Russian. The GRUP members that had previously inhabited the station had interrogated one of their own, a man named Sergei whom they accused of stealing state property. She's not state property, he replied. She has a name. While his GRUP superior accused Sergei of planning to defect to the United States, allegedly in exchange for money and asylum, Sergei denied any collusion with America. He claimed that the GRUP at Provisional Site 3034 were meddling with powers they could not possibly hope to understand. His superior, a man named Vaslov, dismissed this claiming their work to be no different to the United States experimentation with atomic weapons at the time. One does not make deals with atom bombs, Sergei argued. One certainly does not sacrifice little girls to them. Shortly after this, a struggle broke out, with Sergei having to be restrained while urging Vaslov to cease any and all interference with it. The man spoke of terrible nightmares that he'd had, voices screaming in the darkness. That's what he wants, Vaslov. That's what it is. You cannot make a deal with this thing. We have finally contained it, and now you want to offer it. The tape's audio ends shortly after this point, with no clear answer as to what Sergei was referring to, or what offer these Russian operatives had made to it. Ever since the discovery of SCP-3034, members of the SCP Foundation have worked tirelessly to understand the purpose of these countdowns, as well as determine their origin. By September 2012, Dr. Shulkill was reaching the end of his tether with the investigation into the SCP-3034 broadcast. Mm. Over almost half a century, the Foundation had made well over 600 recordings of the Russian girls' countdowns, but still hadn't determined any noteworthy information. They were prohibited from contacting the girl via the same radio frequency, only permitted to use the phrase that stopped her countdowns. Mm -hmm. Running out of options, Shulkill contacted his colleague, Dr. Emerson, asking for an in-depth vocal analysis of the various recordings of SCP-3034. Even if they could narrow down where the broadcast was coming from, maybe by determining the girl's geographical location from her dialect, then that would be at least some slight progress into understanding SCP-3034. While unable to discover the girl's location, Dr. Emerson's analysis did yield some interesting findings. Emerson learned that these countdowns were not pre-recorded. The variations in the Russian girl's voice, her tone, her pitch, all seemed to indicate that every instance of the broadcast was unique. Rather than use the same recording, this girl had been counting down over and over, hundreds of times for almost 50 years. But there was more. Shulkill and Emerson then examined the distortion, the sounds interfering with the audio of the Russian girl's countdowns. What had initially seemed like garbled static seemed to actually be additional voices. And much like the girl's voice, these distorted voices were unique, different in every broadcast. However, Shulkill and Emerson were unable to accurately determine what these voices were saying. Given that the girls' countdowns were always cut short by the use of the phrase, all is well, the doctors did not have long enough samples of the audio to analyze the other distorted voices. With permission from the Foundation, the next five occurrences of the SCP-3034 broadcast were allowed to carry on for longer, 
giving the two doctors enough audio to determine exactly what the distorted voices were. And the results were extremely <gasps> troubling. They were screams. Thousands upon thousands of children's voices endlessly screaming. Both Dr. Emerson and Dr. Schulkill agreed that it would be best to continue responding to SCP-3034 with the correct phrase, and refused to analyze the distorted screaming audio any further. Mm -hmm. Three years later, while stationed at Provisional Site 3034, a Foundation researcher named Dr. Uriel Willis decided to take matters into her own hands. She conducted an experiment that had not been sanctioned by the Foundation and attempted to make contact with the Russian girl giving the countdowns. Hearing Dr. Willis's voice, the girl stopped her countdown. After five long, painfully silent seconds, a new broadcast was heard. A piercing, high-pitched screech that caused extreme pain and dizziness to all the staff working on site. Unable to bear the disorienting sound, Dr. Willis told the girl all is well and caused the noise to stop. The following day, SCP researchers noted that there had been a significant increase in cases of missing children all around the world. A majority of these disappearances happened at the same time the screech had been broadcast, and remain unsolved to this day. Dr. Willis faced disciplinary action from the SCP Foundation, and any further testing of SCP-3034 and attempts to communicate with the Russian girl were prohibited. Only one distinct change has been noted in the SCP-3034 broadcast since this incident. Almost a month later, the countdown was detected in the correct phrase given, but researchers noted that, instead of starting her countdown from 200, this time the Russian girl began counting down from 199. Nobody knows what will happen if the Russian girl's countdown is allowed to reach zero. Personnel working at Provisional Site 3034 are told to always offer her the necessary phrase before this point in the countdown. Attempting to interfere with the broadcast by contacting this girl directly not only resulted in intense pain for SCP staff, but also seems to have caused an unconfirmed number of child disappearances around the globe, as well as reducing the countdown starting number from 200 to 199. After a long night on the road, you finally find the right turn, sending you in the right direction. As you drive through the night, you keep telling yourself one thing, one small phrase over and over again. You hope the words will eventually give you comfort, but deep down you start to realize just how hollow they are. That it's just a lie we tell ourselves so we don't have to face the inevitable. But still, what choice do you have but to keep telling yourself that all is well? Now check out SCP-3001 Red Reality and SCP-4511 Swine God for more nightmares from the world of the SCP Foundation.